and the machine says, I'm live here at the Walter Bosley Channel. I want to welcome all of you to a very special episode, live stream, here at the Walter Bosley Channel. And this one, um, th 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 this one's potentially, we think it's going to be a, a, a really big one. You guys are really going to enjoy this. Um, about a month or so ago, we had on Seshery, and you guys loved that show. That was a fascinating discussion. And a couple weeks back, we had Joseph Farrell, and you guys loved that one. And in the course of uh, that particular episode a couple weeks back, I kind of threw a question out there to Joseph. Um, you know, could, could there have been some type of, you know, across time and space transtemporal uh, result of the use of the Great Pyramid as the Giza Death Star? Um, more specifically, might a blast, so to speak, from the Giza Death Star back in ancient times have caused the Tunguska explosion in 1908? And Joseph said, hypothetically, of course, you know, out on the branch of speculation, that, that sure, it could be possible. And wow, that got my mind racing so that about a week later I thought, we got to get these two guys on here and talk about this. You know, the, the possibility, the, the question of is trans-temporal warfare, so to speak, possible? The, and, and that's the big question of this episode. This is what, generally what we're going to be discussing, the question, are we now, have we, have, have we been in a trans-temporal war on the cosmic level? Now, you know here at the Walter Bosley Channel, we discuss the extraordinary. We reserve the right to discuss the extraordinary, okay? That's what we're here for, to hypothesize, to go out way out on the, 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 the tippy toes of speculation, because that's how you get to the, 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 the truths that you can reach, you know, actually touch while you're reaching farther out there. So uh, that's what this is about. We're meeting here. We're discussing today. And I'm going to bring uh, Cherie and Dr. Joseph Farrell on. And we're going to have a little discussion on this. And then we're going to bring in a panel. We have Bruce McDonald. We have Alien Scientist. And we have Nano Girl as a panel. And they'll be asking questions after uh, we discuss this question a little bit. So, um, again, are we in a trans-temporal cosmic war? So, uh, let me bring on Seshari and Dr. Joseph Farrell. Hey, guys. Howdy. Oh. <laughs> Hi. Well, hey, I, first of all, I appreciate you guys um, squeezing this into your busy schedules. This was an, an unexpected request, very short notice, but um, I, I think it's uh, worth it for us to gather here to discuss this fascinating question. So are, ha, how are you both doing? Having a good day so far? Great. I'm doing great. Hanging in there. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, After the tornado. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Let's start with uh, Seshari has some uh, uh, comments because he listened to, he, he watched the interview with Joseph a couple weeks ago yeah. and really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, there, there was a lot of resonance between what was discussed and, and Sesh's own research and uh, positions. So I um, wanted to give uh, him a chance to go first and uh, present some, some comments. So go ahead, Sesh. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Walter Bosley and I have discussed the phenomenon of time over the years. Uh, at one point, I wrote some letters to Walter about some of my ideas on time. And he has alluded to these letters on occasion during some of his podcasts. Today, I'll touch upon some of these ideas as an introduction to our discussion here on trans-temporal cosmic war. It's my view 
that the ancient Egyptian sages had some very sophisticated philosophical concepts concerning time. I believe they possessed these ideas as a legacy from the previous high civilizations. Conventional etymologists claim that the Indo-European languages were not influenced by the ancient Egyptian language. I found that there are a number of loan words in English that came from ancient Egyptian. Often the words in their transit from language to language become altered or slurred phonetically. One such word is our English word nature. It came initially from the Latin natura and natus, meaning born or produced. This is the idea of entering in to this domain of space-time, and thus time is implied in natura and natus. Practically all of the definitions for our word nature were held for a word in ancient Egyptian with the same phonetics. Conventionally, this ancient Egyptian word is pronounced, actually mispronounced, as netter, and it is mistranslated by Egyptologists as God, small case G. We only have the words consonants, N-T-R. In order to make the word easier to pronounce, Egyptologists of the 19th and 20th centuries inserted E between the consonants, creating the synthetic word netter. This, of course, was not the word's actual pronunciation in ancient Egypt. Present-day Egyptologists will not speculate about the word's original pronunciation. I'm convinced that the word was originally pronounced the same or almost the same as it is pronounced in English, nature or nature. Mm -hmm. But the ancient Egyptians had a whole religion and philosophy based upon something that they called petchet. Mm -hmm. This meant literally nine, but it referenced nine natures mistranslated as gods in English. The seventh meaning of nature is a force or principle that regulates the physical universe. The ancient Egyptians were expressing that there are nine primary principles regulating the physical universe. In this regulation, these principles control what manifests or is born. Note also in meaning seven that such principles can be personified. We're all familiar with one such personification, Mother Nature. The ancient Egyptians had this same personification. They called her Ast. We know her by the Greek form of her name, Isis. All of the nine natures were personified by the ancient Egyptians, thus leading to the later misconception that the high priest of Egypt worshiped nine gods who may even have been historical personages. No, no, no. The nine natures were personifications of abstract principles, just as Schwaller de Lubitsch taught. Joseph Farrell in his book, The Philosopher's Stone, quotes de Lubitsch, quote, there exists a bond between cause and effect, and that bond is called the netter, unquote. Mm -hmm. But why nine primary principles? The nine primary principles are all about time. They define what time is. Let's go back to that ancient Egyptian word for nine, petchet. Are there any words today that could be descendant forms of petchet? Well, what about the English word packet, which came from the Anglo-French paquet? What about the Greek word 
patassos and patanius, meaning to spread out. There was a wide-brimmed hat worn in ancient Greece named patassos. Hermes winged hat also had this name. What about the Hebrew word pisa, meaning a passing over, from which the word Pesach is derived, meaning Passover. Note the similarity of meanings. Packet, to spread out, to pass over. Now consider the Greek word, pektikos, meaning congealing, and piktos, congealed, and even the Latin, pectin, comb. Packet, spread out, pass over, congeal, calm. These ideas are suggestive of something like a complete set. <laughs> I submit that all of these ideas were implied in the ancient Egyptian word pechet, which in its explicit definition or denotation meant nine, but which also connoted such ideas as packet, spreading out, passing over, congealing, and combing. This is exactly what the nine natures do. The nine natures represent a kind of process that Dr. Joseph Farrell has termed a topological descent. Petchet is the topological descent of a fundamental unit of time. This can be expressed as a diagram involving a rotating equilateral triangle. This is the rota of the Rosicrucians. This is the Monus Hieroglyphica of John D, who called it, quote, the true Kabbalah of nature, unquote. The triangle rotates upon its center in one complete rotation. Each vertex of the triangle occupies three positions that are analogically nodal. At each one-third turn of the triangle, each vertex assumes the position that an adjacent vertex occupied at the start of the rotation. This results in all three vertices occupying nine total positions. At each analogical orientation, a vertex takes on a new persona, a new incarnation, as it were. This, this is the source of the nine personifications of primary natural principles in ancient Egypt. The nine orientations encode the topological descent of a single unit or packet of time, petchet of time. Because of this, the structure of nine underlies all rotating systems, all time systems. All harmonics of time intervals are integrated via the infinite set of all natural numbers that are multiples of nine. Nine is the principle of congealing, integrating causal relationships in hearing between karmic frequencies. What do I mean by karmic frequencies? These are the timelines of entities in the physical universe. When an entity is born, when an entity sustains a qualitative change in circumstances, when an entity dies or ceases to exist, these are all determined by temporal nodes along the timeline, combing along the timeline. These are the fundamental topologies of the universe. I strongly suspect that the tablet of destinies referred to in the Babylonian text Enuma Elish were algorithms based upon nine, expressing the karmic frequencies for entities in the physical universe. This passing over, this spreading out, this congealing, this combing, is referring to the trans-temporal phenomenon of time perception, the perception of motion 
following a single vector along a timeline. Time perception is not objective. It is seated in consciousness. Quantum mechanics cannot account for the perception of time, of motion. Motion cannot be perceived in any one instant of time. The ancient Egyptian word for memory is mal. Our English word mo comes from this. Mao implied both cutting by the pictogram of a scythe, but also by another ideogram that conveyed the idea of wide, broad, spacious. Mao is related in the phonetic Kabbalah to the word for load, which is mount. Think of that rotating triangle as being loaded with nine analogical positions at the end of a single rotation. Thus, the perception of time as a spread out sequence that is combed, cut, or passed over can only occur outside of any particular instant of time. And therefore, the perception of time occurs outside of time. Mm -hmm. The perception of time is, by its very nature, a trans-temporal phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Time perception, by its very nature, is a phenomenon of consciousness, of memory. Only through the phenomenon of memory can we perceive motion, can we perceive time. Mm -hmm. And what is the fundamental basis of memory? It is analogy. Only through analogies do we remember. We recall that because it is like this. We recall this because it is like that. Oh, that reminds me. This is remembering, joining one thing to another through analogy. Memory is triggered by analogical correspondence. Perhaps you could see why those nine nodal orientations of a rotating triangle were so important to the ancient Egyptians, as they should be to us. How then is memory accessed? Through analogies. Thus, the engineering of time might be carried out by a kind of analogical calculus as set forth by Joseph Farrell. This opens a Pandora's box filled with dazzling possibilities, but some of them are chilling. It suggests that time may be, will be, and has been engineered, and among other things, engineered as a weapon. Through an act of will, one may travel through time in either direction, forward or reverse. We ordinarily travel in a single vector along the timeline because our minds at a deep unconscious level are hypnotically entrained to follow that vector, to pass over time sequences in a particular direction. If the mind's unconscious programming of time is changed, the direction of time's arrow will also change. That such unconscious programming is in play in our perception of time becomes apparent if we consider the subjectivity of the speed of time's passage. In ordinary consciousness, time seems to pass at a steady pace. However, soldiers and police in stressful combat situations experience a slowing down of time. This shows that the speed of time's passage is seated in consciousness, not in objective reality. And it strongly suggests that the direction of time's passage along a timeline is also subjectively seated. A reversal of time could be considered as only a continuation of a slowing process past a zero point stasis Motion passes into the negative numbers of the timeline. Motion, time, 
becomes reversed. This suggests that time is an information system that the consciousness can reconfigure at will. Reverse time sequences only seem absurd to us because we are mentally conditioned to view time in only one direction. Beings mentally entrained to perceive reverse time might have a bilateral reversal of their internal organs, just as the Russian scientist Kozarev speculated, but they also might literally have eyes in the back of their heads. Such beings would have a memory of the future, but scant knowledge of the past. To them, this would be the normal state of affairs. All this raises questions about our contemporary views of causality, especially as held by present day quantum mechanics. A better understanding of causality may integrate transtemporal relations in the schema of cause and effect. When the multiverse is considered, time observations may be made in reverse or in out of sequence orders. The Russian scientist Kozarev made tests that showed effects being transmitted without momentum, arguing for the simultaneity of causation in material systems. This would allow for transtemporal causation. An effect might precede its cause as observed in our ordinary timeline. Evidence that history can be changed exists with the many instances of the Mandela effect observed since 2009. I was privy to secret information that the Mandela effect was expected to occur by those at the highest levels of world power. In 1992, I was told by an individual that discontinuous changes in our consensus history would begin to be noticed by the mass of humanity in the early 21st century, certainly by the 2020s. This has come to pass. At the highest level of science and policy, it was believed that the cause of these time discontinuities would be the passage of our solar system through a beam of energy emanating from the center of our galaxy. This would be causing domains of time to shift into parallel universes. This natural cause of time disruption may have been disinformation to cover the employment of a technology. The Mandela effect mm -hmm. is a series of individuated discontinuities, much more suggestive of the targeting involved with an artificial system. Mm -hmm. In this period of time that we live in, we might expect more people to be experiencing <coughs> spatio-temporal discontinuities shifts into parallel realities, teleportations across the landscape, and even literal travel into the past. Any changes in the usual flow of time could not be affected capriciously, but only according to the principles of time harmonics applied to a specific time and place. These changes could only be affected by consciousness, but could be assisted or magnified through technical devices or natural phenomena interfacing with the brain. In the case of shifts of history, the individual's mind would be reincarnated into a parallel universe. Can the universe be navigated transtemporally in any direction? Could the Great Pyramid, as a nonlinear, non-local scalar weapon, strike targets in the past, such as the planet that may have exploded millions of years ago to form the asteroid belt? Are we even now engaged in a transtemporal cosmic war with forces spread out over past, present, and future? I will leave this question for all of us to discuss today and will close my introduction with a quote from Joseph P. Farrell's Cosmic War. In any case, 
it seems that Atrahasis is more than a mere epic, for it hints at dark designs and agendas at work in the pantheon, and moreover clearly suggests that mankind, whether in his hybrid form or not, is perhaps both battlefield and prize in a much larger cosmic conflict. Thank you. Yeah. Sesh, th thank you for that incredible. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Laying a, that's one heck of a foundation to really <laughs> jump from there. Um, what I'm going to do is throw it to Joseph. You want to, yep. You want to add anything to that, or just well, jump no. Right in? Um, um, what can I add? Uh, he basically hit all all the points that I I was going to talk about myself. Uh, the the etymology uh, part of it at the beginning, I I find myself in mere thousandths of a decimal point of total agreement. <laughs> Because, yeah. because I've thought the same thing for many years, particularly regarding natures. About the only, about the only thing that I might not necessarily take issue with, but uh, entertain a very different hypothesis, is that the the nine natures that Sesh is talking about, I would tend to view not simply as personifications, but as actual intelligent entities as, as beings. It's very um, interesting, Joseph. Um, um, I, I'd like to hear more about that. Well, let me put it this way. I don't want to talk about it right now because I'm writing okay. a book about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> but gotcha. suffice, suffice it to say that, that the nine natures that you're talking about, that, that you mentioned Schwaller de Lubish is talking about and so on, yeah. uh, this has been around for a long time. It's in Plotinus's Aeneids, which of course is just mm -hmm. the nines. Uh, it's You find it in, in Dionysius, the Areopagite, the celestial hierarchies, cherubim, seraphim, thrones, principalities dominate, you know, the, the whole three by three nine natures scheme of his. Uh, so yeah, it, it repeats itself over and over. So I, you know, I don't have any difficulty with that. What I zeroed in on in your introduction was two things. Actually, a lot of things, but let's try and narrow it down to two things. You use the phrase time harmonics and analogical correspondences, and then uh, repeatedly use the word set. Yeah. And what we're talking about, a, a temporal war, Walter posed the question, could, could the scalar weaponry, the temporal weaponry, be used to go back and destroy something that could interfere with the very weapon itself being built? And that's just another version of the grandfather paradox about time travel that we all know. You know, you travel backward and you shoot your grandfather. Does that kill you? You know, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. The problem that, that this version of dealing with time, and you pointed this out as well, is that it's dealing with time as a delta T function, which is the way it's normally modeled in mathematical physics, a system state change. And that it is therefore impossible in that idea of a vector of time to go back and do something like this. However, I think this approach to time is totally misplaced. Because I view time, you know, I'm an organist, so let me see if I can draw an analogy for people. I grew up playing pipe organs, so I'm very familiar with the harmonic series. You have to be in order to play a pipe organ. There's just no two ways about it. So you learn very early on that you don't have to tune the instrument to exact equal tempering. This is another thing that people don't get. You know, there's all this nonsense out there about A440. You know? <laughs> I just, I just, it really sends me because a harmonic can be within a few decimal points of a particular frequency and still function as a harmonic. So in other words, 
you may have your note A tuned to A439.872. And only a very careful ear is going to pick that up as being different from A440. And the resonator, here's the important point, the resonator that's producing that frequency will still oscillate to A440 because A440 is close enough to A479 points, you know. On and on we could go. Mm -hmm. So my point here is if you view time and different events as a set of elements rather than as a simple delta T function, you are much more able to understand that you can recreate all the elements or as many elements of a past event or a past configuration of space-time and still have a resonant effect on those events. In fact, you can tune that set of elements to appear at a particular time. You do not, therefore, have to incorporate the subset of that set that we're going to call the causality of that event. And that subset may itself be composed of several more elements. In other words, you may go back and discover that shooting your grandfather does not inhibit the production of you for various reasons, that your grandfather is not that kind of effective or efficient cause. So in other words, what I'm suggesting here is that if you, if you get out of the standard linear classical physics model of time and start dealing with time as a set of elements that can be formally specified, that's the key then yeah, it's possible to engineer something to tune to a particular time or place in the future and have it affect the past and vice versa. And by the way, it's, it's really not that, that difficult an idea because all I'm talking about here with this idea of set theory and set distance is simply another version of quantum entanglement, much more, uh, much more elaborate than the one that we've been taught or told is, is the actual basis of entanglement. But entanglement basically is dealing with one element in a set, namely the spin rotation or polarization of a particle. But why not en allow entanglement of several elements in sets? And that's all I'm really talking about. And uh, you mentioned something very interesting, that there are evidences that this might be taking place. Well, there are now evidences out there through the work of Dr. William Tiller, uh, the material scientist at um, University of Southern California, in fact, that recently died, that the, the effect of entanglement does occur at a macro level and that it can be directly modified and affected by group conscious intention. So this That's is yet, very interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting work because he had people agree on a formally specified intention to alter the pH levels, the acidity levels in certain organisms without any physical contact or any other manipulation whatsoever. And this happened. You know, it's it's a documented occurrence. So I think these things are definitely possible. I don't think that the grandfather paradox is carefully enough stated because we're dealing with a different kind of mathematical model to model what's taking place than is the case in standard physics. So I agree with that. Now notice that what Sesh is proposing, what we're proposing with the idea that you can temporally modify by an action in the future, an action or state of systems in the past. Notice that what we're proposing is the collapse of special relativity. <laughs> yes. So, you know, um, take that for whatever it's worth, folks. <laughs> you know, I'm just tossing that out there. Um, because you once, you once you get to the point that you're saying consciousness can do this, then you have also set a you've just thrown the whole speed of light 
as an invariable speed limit in all frames of reference right out the window. <laughs> so, yes. So you're dealing with information transfer across. Uh, let's put it this way: you're dealing with information transfer across enormous distances, and not limited to mere quanta uh, scale. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I, I toss that out there as the big as the big check mark against this whole idea that that a standard physicist would probably object to had if they were here listening to this conversation. But anyway, that's my uh, that's my my presentation. You you have to think of time as a harmonic. Uh, sure. Joseph, words, may I ask a question here? Um, sure. Um, can you speak to this aspect of the multiverse? Um, is it that you don't see that as a necessary scenario to to have these transtemporal effects, or or how does that play into it? The, the multiverse problem, the concept. Problem, well, the multiverse plays into it because if uh, on this kind of set theory, set distance theory, harmonic view, a multiverse could play into it as as a as a set of different overtones okay, gotcha. in, in a temporal harmonic series. Yes. But the problem Overtone. with that is that a, a standard theoretical physics approach would view the multiverse as being utterly contradictory to what we're talking about. Yes. Uh, but what I'm, what I'm proposing is, is if you are, if you are modeling temporal events, in terms of set theory and you have a sophisticated enough language to do that in other words to take a certain string of events and model it mathematically we're talking isaac asimov foundation right. sort of stuff here exactly. if you have if you have that kind of mathematical specificity and sophistication then the idea of a multiverse really goes away what you're dealing with now is a system of overtones and resonances and those resonance effects ripple out through time okay yes. so you're dealing you you know the old adage is history doesn't repeat but it does rhyme well this is going to be the case you know the old cyclic view of history is is has a truth in it in that history does spiral you're going to repeat to certain basic structures of events repeatedly. You know, just think of astronomy. But it's going to be doing so in a, a macro system that is constantly changing and can never reproduce exactly a previous event. Yeah. And therefore, that's the vector of time. So, You're still preserving it, but you can have feedback loops within it. Now, so that would preclude the possibility like the Nietzschean eternal return concept uh -huh. um, would would the eternal return be possible would it just be a circle of those feedback loops going around in a circle or is this an open-ended thing where it would just continue on indefinitely I think, I think it's open-ended yeah mm -hmm. uh, and the one of the reasons I think it's open-ended is that we're also dealing obviously right now uh chin to chin with the question of free choice well the problem you know you know me i'm eastern orthodox so i'm constantly railing on on the piss poor way western christian theology tried to frame everything well if you follow saint augustine of hippo he has a four-stage <laughs> program for human freedom posse picari that's the Garden of Eden. It's possible to sin. After that, it's non posse, non picari. Not possible not to sin. <laughs> okay. Then we get to Christianity, and then it becomes posse, picari, uh, posse non picari. Possible not to sin. And then we get to heaven where it's non posse picari, where it's not possible to sin. So in other words, you're sitting there in heaven contemplating the divine essence. You're not moving you're not able to direct your attention or will anywhere else. And so therefore you don't really have free choice. 
Is it Joseph, that, that, that kind of sounds like Donald Rumsfeld. In well, the, the, exactly. The... <laughs> I mean, you know, it's coming out of the administration of Bush the stupid. What else do you expect? But, but anyway, uh, isn't you know, this, that, um... this idea that, that free choice is always a choice between good and evil is nonsense. Because free choice, when you stop and think about it, most often is exercised as a choice between alternative goods. Do I want to go grocery shopping today or do I want to stay home and tend my vegetable garden? You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this whole binary idea that we've got locked in our heads, uh, to me, is it's nonsense. Uh, is there a free choice in heaven? Of course there is. You know, It's going to be a very boring place if it isn't. Um, so yeah, you know that um, that uh, rigid view of heaven where there's no motion and no change. Right, isn't that very similar to what the ancient Egyptians believed about becoming permanent, and identifying with Horus and all that? Well, I think I that? think I think the ancient Egyptians are much closer to the idea of a a state uh, that you are in a state of ever being and ever well-being in other words yes. that you cannot rigidly separate being and becoming yeah so in other words you know they're not sitting around like in dante's uh paradiso they're not sitting yeah. around in a big circle contemplating the ultimately simple divine essence which because it has no distinctions they can't move right they're just you know they're just locked in uh you know all of this falls out I think of of this linear binary way of thinking, and if anybody is not linear and binary, it's the Egyptians. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're just not into that <laughs> worldview, and that's why they're so difficult for for us to understand. Yes, you know we we've been raised with this this Augustinian theological culture for 20, for 20 centuries. And mm -hmm. it's so much a part of our way of thinking that people can't think in any other way. It's just like yeah. money. We can't think of money as being anything else other than monetized debt. You know, <laughs> pe pe people are very superstitious about this way of thinking. Oh, you so think? They, 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 yeah. They, they get a little scared and nervous if you suggest, you know, um, it, it's taken me years of knowing both of you guys to come out of my own bonds of that, you know, binary thinking. Uh, oh, it's, it's, and... it's everywhere. But, but when you stop and think about it, this is exactly the kind of thinking behind this temporal paradox problem. And the problem with that is, is. And, and I rail against this all the time. I, every time I look at modern mathematical physics and they start talking about time as the fourth dimension. Hmm. Well, they're always talking in terms of this delta T idea of time, a vector. We're moving from here, from this point to that point, and there's nothing else. <laughs> well, yeah. you know, since, since when have, since when has that kind of geometry been the be all and end all of geometry. We we grew up with Euclid. Every one of us listening to this broadcast right now can not only think in terms of lines, we can think in terms of planes and cubes, you know, and some of us hypercubes, you know, on and on it goes. So why should time be any different? Why should time be a mere scalar? Right. Right. Um you know, we, we, we have been talking about and we will continue to talk about the, uh, you know, I, I went to journalism school and then I became a professional investigator after that. So the five W's are a very, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first go to tool in, in my line of work and the three what, where and when we have discussed mm -hmm. and we will continue to discuss mostly mm -hmm. ultimately, um, you know, we have to come we, we have to go back to the who and we have to come to the why. Mm -hmm. And do either one of you have, uh, you know, well, I know you have ideas, but let's hear your ideas on the who and the why of a transtemporal cosmic war. Sesh? Oh, wow. I think I want to defer to Joseph on that. Um, uh, I think he'd have much more interesting things to say than I would, but I'll I'll listen to him, and then if I have some little thought, I'll 
pipe in my two cents. Well, I think I think the Who is basically a good old fashioned Lucifer, but here's why. Um, if you look at at the way traditional theology attempts to rationalize that particular being, whether you call him Lucifer or you know Shiva or Iblis or what have you, the idea that there is a an evil personal being of tremendous power. Well, if you look at the at the traditional theology of Lucifer, and I hope people really latch on to this. This is all important. Traditional theology would tell you that Lucifer has a his personhood itself is set in diametric opposition to his own nature. I hope you latch on to that. Because it means that he remains by nature a good creature, but that everything that he does and thinks is directed against himself and what he is in an absolute hatred of it. And this simultaneously means that ultimately he's irrational. And he's locked into that. And the reason he's locked in is also very interesting. Sesh mentioned a, a trans-temporal experience of time. In other words, you have to have some part of you that exists absolutely outside of time in order even to be able to perceive a change in the system state that we call time. In Lucifer's case, and I'm going to borrow from Aquinas here, when Aquinas says that the angels make a choice because they are outside that arrow or vector of time, any vector, past to future, future to past, what have you, because of that, at the very instant they make a choice, they also form a habit of will. Our choices form a habit of will over several ex exercises or exertions of that will and that's how our habit is formed it's formed temporally an angel's habit is formed non-temporally and therefore once lucifer makes a choice of revolt that becomes his habit of will at the same time as that choice is made so now you're locked into a system and into a cosmos quite literally where you have karma, where you have these cycles of repetition, and on and on it goes. Ultimately, that cycle has to be broken, totally broken, for things to be fixed. But this is why I think when we're talking about cosmic war, I mean that I mean what I say when I say man is the battleground and the prize and that this has been going on for a very long time, and it's not confined to this little blue ball on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy <laughs> either. Uh, right. it, it's, it's a massive struggle. Oh. We see evidence of it everywhere. Um, I, I have a question for you, Joseph. Um, uh, sort of a statement and, and a question. Um, oh. Let me see if I can marshal my thoughts here. Um, um, this is about the Tablet of Destinies. Uh -huh. In what little I've read of it, it seems that this thing is a device that yes. you could say drives the user insane. Am I mistaken in that? No, I think, I, think that's, I think that's uh, a very valid insight. Uh, in my view, I mean, I, this, I'm, I'm relating that to what you've just said about Lucifer and about uh, uh, how choices are made by various entities in the universe, you know, uh, that uh, it's almost like this information that the user has as a human being or as perhaps these weren't human beings, uh, Marduk and Nergal, right. they were some kind of some kind of incarnated physical beings though it seems to me yeah. the way it's described and that those kind of beings aren't really capable of handling that kind of information that it's 
such extreme power. Uh, I think it's such extreme power, but um, I don't necessarily think that the it's the extremity of the power that is corrupting here. The corruption comes from the intention of the will. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't, I don't doubt for a moment that having those things around, the tablets of destinies around, would not exert a corrupting influence. Because I do think that there is some sort of, of I don't know how else to put it, a topology of intention that can literally embed itself in a physical object or a constellation of physical objects in a particular form or fashion. A kind of memory. A kind of memory, a kind of psychotronics, a kind Mm -hmm. of amulet, whatever you want to call it. Uh, And, and if people think that I'm, I'm being uh, unchristian or whatever here, I point out to people that, that, the formal principles of magic behind an amulet and the formal principles behind a sacrament are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You have a specified formal intention. You have a physical matter that is necessary for that intention, and you have to express that in a particular way. So, you know, this, this is very, very old thinking. Uh, You, um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Well, uh, going back to your question, I think what happens is the 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 dictum of Lord Acton: power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Absolute. You're reading my mind, Joseph. Well, <laughs> that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, to address. It, it's, it's true, but then by the same token, I think there's a corollary to Acton's dic- dictum, yes. and that is that the corrupt seek power. And uh-huh. that the absolutely corrupt uh-huh. seek absolutely that's absolute power. Very interesting. Yes, um, but I was what I was going to ask you about that was: is there something about power that intrinsically corrupts, or is think, it as you said that it so. just attracts those who are have evil intentions? Uh, both. I, I think I think power can corrupt. I I mm-hmm. I, I really do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was involved for many years of my life at very high levels in the church, and I watched yes. this happen all the time, yeah. all the time. Yeah. Decent people, and then they would get to a particular position or even, you know, be made a hierarch or something, and then all of a sudden it's like they went nuts. Yeah. Uh, I've seen it more than once. Uh, so I do tend to think that there's something there is something inherently corrupting about power unless you are, uh, I don't know how else to call, put it, other than to say unless you are spiritually disciplined to the point that it's not a temptation. It's, it's not, a, um, it's not a, the cause of, of your being. For Lucifer, that power is, in a certain sense, the cause of his personal existence. His personal existence is now wrapped up with being evil. And to lose that, he loses his identity. I want to get back to Lucifer again, get, get you back on that track. But um, I had a, an in, a, a thought here that I'd like to present to you for you to comment on. Um, and this is about all of the ancient text. It's not just the Babylonian, but the Vedic and I have to say, even the Hebrew text, they've mm-hmm. both been problematic for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they seem to exhibit elements of profundity and absurdity side by side. Mm-hmm. The gods, though they're living for thousands of years, possessing super advanced technology, often display infantile and primitive behaviors. Mm-hmm. You know, in the Babylonian epic Enuma Elish, Marduk mm-hmm. and Nergal are psychotic. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, Nurgle wants the Tablet of Destinies. He wants humanity. But why? The gods have this super advanced technology, but they're doing exhausting manual labor, so mm-hmm. they have to make man as a slave. Mm-hmm. This makes no sense whatsoever to me. Uh, you know, even we humans with 
primitive technology have made slavery obsolete with the limited machinery that we do have. So it, mm -hmm. it seems to me that all this uh, talk about labor in these texts must be either a metaphor or a or even a confused idea about what had really happened. I get the feeling these ancient texts are mm -hmm. the work of a cargo cult, and they just don't yeah. know what the hell's going on. They're trying to explain it. Well, I I I I see the difficulty, and it is a difficulty, and the difficulty comes from taking the texts as they are. Yeah. Uh, there's, in other words, there's no there's no corresponding documentary hypothesis. For Babylonian texts, there's no there's no JEPD theory of the Atrahasis epic or the Enuma Elish. And if people are wondering what I'm talking about, that is the principal theory that scholars to this day think is behind the, the first five books of the Bible, the five books of Moses. They they think that there are four different sources, and that here comes the clincher, and that those sources can be reconstructed from the text. Now, I think that's all a bunch of horse hockey, this idea that you can reconstruct it. I don't think that's possible. Are there sources? Probably. Are there sources behind the Babylonian text? And ultimately, we get a war, and then we get nonsensical explanations like, well, we need to make mankind to go mine our gold because we're too lazy to do it. And then that's we're going to, and that's a hard one. And then we're going to wipe him out because he's making too much noise. That's literally. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally what's going on in, in some of these Babylonian epics. And you're thinking, what? <laughs> it, it reminds me of somebody like, just take an old farmer who's completely yes. illiterate, doesn't understand anything. Yep. And something happens over there and he yep. says, well, you know, they're, uh, they're making too much noise. That's why they had to do it. You know, it's yeah. just sort of a folk explanation. Of yeah, I, this is exactly what I think is going on. We have to remember, and this has always been my 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 caveat with this when we're dealing with these texts we are dealing with texts of a legacy civilization trying to pass down stories or and relate stories that they heard from grandma and grandpa and that grandma and grandpa heard from their grandma and grandpa and so on and so forth and to me the core of the story is the attempt to preserve as as much as they could in the language that they knew of, of this technology. And then they get nonsensical explanations for the motivations of these people. However, that said, there's another caveat. Look at our own modern technocrats. And look at their, look at what they want to do. They are so abysmally secure and confident in their power and their technology and their forecasting tools and so on, that they literally want to get rid of most of the population of the globe. Yes. So nothing really has changed. The modern technocrat is nothing but the Babylonian God out to wipe out mankind because he's making too much noise. <laughs> you know? Or in our case, we've got too much cow flatulence. You know, it's just, it's oh, yeah. just nonsense. Yeah. So, uh, with, um, I, I think, a tag on to the discussion of the who. Sesh, did you have any comments in response to that before I well, jump us to um, another? I, I find it very interesting, all of this. Um, and I agree with what Joseph's saying. Um, I, I do have some thoughts that maybe I don't want to voice right now about those technocrats that Joseph was <laughs> talking about. So I think I'll just edit that part out, you know. I'm holding back too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Joseph knows what I'm thinking about, and you too, Walter. Probably but, do. <laughs> and a few sure. other people out there. Sure. Sure. Um, but um, I do think that um, there's this issue of cosmic evil yes. it's in all the world's religions yes uh, and um and i you know i could say i believe but i would say the evidence shows that it's real right and that th this is the explanation of history yeah. this is what history is all about that um and 
you know, I'll, I'll invoke that old alchemical uh, saying as above, it, so below. Uh, as below, mm -hmm. as above, etc. Um, that uh, what's going on here on Earth is an analog or a model for what's going on cosmically throughout the whole universe. Uh, this is part of what I'm thinking about when we talk about trans-temporal cosmic war. Mm -hmm. That um, And you talk about the, um, the unification of intention. What is the phrase you use? Um, unified intention of symbol. Symbol. Yes. Um, that, that's a very powerful intellectual tool there, the unified intention of symbol. Um, because I think that's the way you would approach this major issue of history, uh, that if you're wondering about what was going on in those ancient times, you can get a model of it, just as you're talking about the bureaucrats now, you get a model of it and an insight of right. what it's all about. It's not a big mystery, really. It's not yeah. a big mystery, and and you know the old adage is human nature has not really changed all that much, yes. and it really hasn't. You know we're we're still we've we've got bigger and more sophisticated toys, but basically we still you know think to do the same thing with the toys. Now there's something mm -hmm. I'm going to be I'm writing a nonfiction book myself right now, and in fact I've written it, but I'm going to be going back over it and putting new things in. And I'm sure both of you know what I'm talking about. Um, but one of the key points in it is this issue of what I call astral form. Mm -hmm. Because I think that is what this whole thing about mankind being a pawn in this cosmic war is all about. Uh, something happened a long time ago that put these archangels or um i don't know joseph what term would you use for lucifer you know in in terms of uh, a theological uh, terminology to describe what he is is he an archangel or well if you if you buy the idea that the biblical terminology principalities thrones powers and all that yes. stuff is an indicator of a different species or genus yes then I would put Lucifer probably at a throne. In other words, in that first rank. First rank, yes. Of, of the first top uh -huh. three cherubim, seraphim, and thrones. So, okay. you, know, you know, like in, um, um, I'm trying to remember uh, Milton's, um, mm -hmm. uh, which one? Uh, it's Paradise Lost. Paradise Lost, I think. Um, um it seems that he's placing the conflict between God and Lucifer before the creation of Adam, well before, and yes. maybe well before the creation of the physical universe. Yes. And, um, and which is my view of the thing. And yes. I think, you know, it's kind of a general theological view. Um, uh, so these beings, they aren't really natural i i shouldn't use the word natural but uh th it's not in their nature i can't get away from that word natural uh their intrinsic qualities are not part of space time they they were created to not be a part of space time right well uh, i think i i think i can help your dilemma if i if i'm okay. reading your dilemma correctly and i think yeah. i am yeah um most let's look at Islamic tradition for a minute and what it says about Iblis, its version of Satan. And it, it is a view that is very similar to people like C.S. Lewis and so on. And it's a view that I personally subscribe to. Iblis and the angels are created prior to creation, okay, to the physical creation. But Iblis's revolt is precisely because Allah wants to make this little monkey with, you know, his consort down here on this little blue marble, wants to give that little monkey his image. So Iblis revolts in pre-knowledge that the intention is to create the monkey. Okay. 
Now, I think there's a much more uh, pertinent way to express this. And, and, you know, I obviously borrowed from that idea in the Cosmic War statement that man is the battlefield and the prize. And it goes to what's happening now in modern physics with the anthropic principle. And it also is related to the ancient idea that man is a microcosm. Man is a little universe. We are, in terms of the physics of the universe, this is a mind blower, folks, but in terms of our sheer scale alone, we are at exactly the arithmetic mean between the physics of the very small particles and so on and the physics of the very large, supergalactic clusters and so yeah. on. We are smack in the middle. Yep. So in other words, if you want to break the cosmos, you don't have to break the whole machine. You just throw a monkey wrench in the central part of it, us. Or to look at it differently, the way the ancients look at it. What are we? Well, we're partly physical creatures, obviously. We've got chemistry, we've got electromagnetics, you know, we've got all of this stuff. And yet there is a part of us that cannot be explained by any purely materialistic philosophy, period. There's a part of us that exists outside of this. So to put it topologically, we're the common surface that binds all of this together. That and makes the, uh, humanity very unique in a way. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I've i said this to other people, and this is my opinion, uh, an intuition, is that uh, the human, and when I say human, I'm not particularly referring to earthlings. but Homo sapiens. sapiens. Homo, the Homo sapiens sapiens, something right. close to that, is the highest form of... Uh, soul incarnation in the universe we are at the apex right. uh, and i'm what i'm talking about here i'm referring to all the uh ideas about alien beings you know and particularly the so-called ets coming to earth uh, uh and they have all this advanced technology but in my opinion those beings most of them are actually quite primitive as individuals in relation mm -hmm. to a human being, we, uh, our emotional capacity and our ability to choose and our volition is so powerful, we're far beyond these little gray entities mm -hmm. who are uh, entrained uh, uh, among themselves like a hive, mm -hmm. a hive mentality, and they're very efficient at functioning as a group but you get one off by himself and he's not be. as capable as a human being. But what, I just want to see what you think about that. Well, I think that's entirely true. This is why I think the technocratic vision of the future will fail. Absolutely. Because it's a vision of humanity that fundamentally does not work. The, the gray is the now, gray is their vision of humanity. Uh, yes. Uh, the, you know, uh, of course, there's been all kinds of debunking of the MJ-12 papers. We don't know ah. if that is just malarkey or if there's some truth in it. But I do try to correlate those things with other things I do know. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, common ideas out there uh, comes from the MJ-12 papers that the grays or the EBEs uh, represent what they called a an evolutionary, the, the, the backside of an evolutionary arc. And I read that years ago, like 1980 or early 80s, and it didn't mean as much to me then as it did later on when I began understanding what's going on with the advancement of technology and synthesizing things, particularly the human body. There's and, an even... You know, there's an even better reference in the yeah. MJ-12 documents. Yeah. And that is, and it's a very short, I mean, it's no longer than a few words, but it is loaded with significance. And that is the observation 
that they made, allegedly viewing these alien bodies, they made the observation that they may have to consider that the humanoid form is of a higher order biology than had previously been suspected. In other words, they're invoking yes. a topological metaphor yes. mm -hmm. to explain what they've encountered. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think, I think this goes directly to what we've talked about before with, with the ancient texts and all of these stories, be it from the Bible, be it from the Enuma Elish or the Atrahasis or Epic of Ninurta or wherever we encounter ancient texts, the, the Popol Vuh with the Maya, for that matter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, wherever you encounter these stories of human beings having been engineered into existence by the gods, okay? And I, I now have come to the position that I think I know what they're talking about. I think I know what they're getting at. Is that going to go in your new That's book? That's going to be the new book. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm well, ask the new, you that. The, to 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 put to put it very plainly, there is a part of the weapon hypothesis of the Great Pyramid I have never discussed. Ever. I've put out about fifty percent of it. The reason I haven't discussed, and and when I originally wrote the book, I included, like everybody knows, I included all my epigraphs. I had an epigraph in there. The, in in the book being rejected by the original publisher, I decided to take that epigraph out. So I've never published the epigraph until now with the fourth pyramid book. I just want to see what people are going to do with it because now there's enough information out there to back up the epigraph and and to to create a basis of speculation for the implications of the epigraph. okay? Mm -hmm. Once that other 50% is re-included, I think it becomes very clear why this trans-temporal type of warfare, this focus on what, why are we so focused on these little monkeys on this planet in an average galaxy way on the edge of the, you know, why all of this? Uh, I think it becomes clear once, Can I once ask you we start a question real quick uh, sure. before I forget it. Um, I'm going to go back to what you were saying about the physical size of the human being being situated halfway between the extremely small and the extremely mm -hmm. large. Mm -hmm. um, the I'm beginning to lose my thought. I'm sorry. Um, well, that's okay. It's it's part of this. It's part of this uh, thinking in, think in in anthropic principle physics that if you adjust the the coefficients of the physical constants in a very very small way one way or the other life is impossible um i just remembered what i was going to ask you <laughs> uh excuse me um the the question is um i'm having a mental dump here that's strange Go ahead, Joseph. I'm sorry. Well, the 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 basic <laughs> idea of the cosmological principle, anthropic principle of physics, is that adjust the constants a few ways, one way or the other, and life does not arise. And therefore, right, intelligent life can arise. And if if the universe is observer dependent, yes, then we're necessary to the proper functioning of the universe. Right. Now, I agree with that. Um, I, I hope people listen very carefully to that because it's an acid drip on all classical systems of metaphysics. Yes. Uh, no matter what they are, monotheism, polytheism, panentheism, pantheism, you know, all of them fall by the wayside because none of them are able to capture the subtlety of what the physics is saying. Now, the physics is not saying there's no such thing as transcendence. It's not saying that because the physics can't say that. And you run into philosophical problems if you do attempt to say that. But in terms of all the other little metaphysical systems that we learned in graduate philosophy in college, <laughs> yeah, you know, they, they don't work. 
So I want to take another stab at asking you this question. I've had two mental dumps on it, but here's what I'm, I wanted to ask you. Given that the human being is halfway between the very small and the very large, mm -hmm. what is your opinion about the location of our solar system in the whole universe? What I'm getting at here is, what do you think about the idea that we are literally, this? we're going back mm -hmm. to to old astronomical concepts here. Yes. Uh, what do you think about the idea that the earth is practically in the center of the physical universe, that this is the center of where the big bang, so to speak, originated was somewhere around here. We're in the middle of it. Uh, does that seem absurd? Uh, no, it doesn't seem absurd because it's observer based. Uh, how, how do you relate that supposition to all of this about the red shift uh you know the 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 standard explanation for that is everything is expanding so it's going to look like you're at the center of the universe no matter where you are that's the well, standard response let let me put it this way sesh there is a reason why there is a huge reason why and Folks, I, I to me, writing books are like a chess match. You have to plan things out way in advance. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you don't do this sure. haphazardly. That's right. All right. Yeah. In the Cosmic War, I took very careful pains to avoid discussing the Big Bang Theory uh -huh. other than in a negative light. Uh, I noticed that uh, because I had a lot of questions about the Big Bang Theory and in, in, you know, in all your books, I never really, I thought, well, what does Joseph Farrell think about that? But it's not there. You know? It's not there. <laughs> it's those, not there. For a dog a very, that did not bark. In it's the a dog that didn't <laughs> bark. That's right. Um, bravo. Doff my hat. Because this dog that didn't bark is not a Big Bangist. You're not a you're not a big banger. No, I'm not. Okay, can you thank can you, you speak Albert? To, can, can you? Um, so I, I don't have what's, any particular view on it. But what, what's the what's cosmology? What's the cosmology I do write about in yeah. the Cosmic War? It's plasma cosmology. It's plasma, yes. Hannes Alfvén, Eric Lerner, Anthony Peratt. Yeah. Now, folks, if you like to sit around and read physics books like I do, and you've been brought up on the Big Bang or even the Oscillating Universe Theory, if you can remember that one, uh, and Albert Einstein sitting down and reading Hannes Vein and Anthony Peratt and the plasma physics people, that's a whole different ball of wax altogether. A whole different one. Because you are dealing now with a physics that makes sense of a lot of ancient metaphor. And I go no further than that because I don't want to give away the but, new book. All right. Well, let me ask you a question about this. It's been my thought that the Big Bang Theory actually evolved out of the Kabbalah. And mm -hmm. the, the Ein Sof and all mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. um, would you agree with that? Or I would agree. I would agree to the extent that that these systems are talking about a a beginning yeah. of existence that is both within and outside of time at the same yeah. time. OK, now, yeah. the other thing that that those systems are also doing is they they are telling you that you cannot pinpoint where that happens. There's no where yet. I, There's no where. So you have to, you, you have to work backwards from existence itself. But the problem there is once you work backwards, you run into something and that's the idea of entanglement and that first singularity. Yes. What if that singularity itself is an example of entanglement? Well, let me ask you this. Uh, how do you relate your plasma physics 
to the ideas of the primary scission as uh, set forth by Delubich? Very easy. Do you okay. rem do you remember the the and I I really don't want to go any further into this. This is okay. all about what I'm writing about now, okay. and okay. I I don't want people to jump the gun and get out there and write right. all of this stuff before I have a chance. You know because okay, the people that are the gun jumpers are already screwing things up. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can gotcha. tell you that. Because they're in this mad rush to forget everything that traditional philosophy has taught them. You know, to me, this is always a bad clue that you're dealing with a new age nut. But anyway, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, if you re go back and remember the, the basic tenets of Platonic or Neoplatonic philosophy, or for that matter, early Gnosticism, what do they all say? That there is an ultra fine matter. The 19th century physicists called it the ether luminiferous. It's so fine, in fact, that it's really not material. I mean, the particles that quantum mechanics deals with are not really particles, they're packets of mathematical information. <laughs> that's, that's about all you can say about them, okay? It, it's information. It's, it's equations, and they're spinning up equations in their particle accelerators and ramming them together to see what derivatives they can pick out of the debris. <laughs> you know? Now, aren't they saying that everything's made out of that, so you and I yeah. are just yeah. equations? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, in other words, I've always been on, I've always been on the material, you know, mind German idealism side of this question, if you want yeah. to put it that way. But anyway... They are talking about a, a form of matter that is so immaterial that when they start talking about us, they talk about dense matter. Yes. Okay, so in other words, they're, they're talking about a continuum. You get a lot of that in Blavatsky talking you about get a lot dense of it in, matter. Yeah, you get a lot of it in Blavatsky and people like this. Well, you know, they're just rehashing a very, very old idea. Yeah, yeah. Now, where, where plasma physics is entering into this is most people are not aware that plasma is about 99% of all matter in the universe. So the physics that you and I are talking about, solids, liquids, and gases, is the physics of the 1%. That's Einstein. The physics I'm talking about is the physics that's making that 1% possible. So in other words, in terms of your question of primary scission, where is this stuff located? It's, it's one of the first derivatives in that topological metaphor because at a certain point, when you start piling derivatives on top of derivatives, it begins to take on material characteristics. That's yes. my point. Yes, yes. I think um, uh, that's pretty clear in your books, you know, that... Mm -hmm. That uh, it emerges out of all of these iterations, right? Um, of nothing. <laughs> well, let's, general, let's, okay. let's remember I, I, in every a, dis, in every description in that metaphor, in every description of every derivative that you can derive, yeah, every single one, you are at some point going to have present in that description the empty hyperset, the oh, no thing. Here's where I take. Uh, an objection to what you're saying. Um, I have a big problem with the idea of nothing being something. <laughs> I can well, it isn't a something. It is a or that, thing. Or that something can result from nothing. Maybe I could put it that way. That's because you're uh, thinking of materialistically. You need to think okay, of it in terms but, of information. Well, yes. but uh, So that's my point, that um, uh, this thing you're calling nothing is... Now, if you said consciousness, then I could understand. Now, consciousness is not material, uh, but so that's what you know. I think. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oops. I think. Yep. There she My is. canine home security unit just went off. I gotta get the door. <laughs> so, are are you talking? Oh, okay. 
I'm going to uh, be bringing the panel in shortly, but before I do that, I have one final question to ask you guys prior to the panel. So as soon as Joseph returns, we'll get to that. Go ahead, Sesh. How are we doing on time? We're doing great. We're doing fine. We're at the we're up just about at the uh, ninety minute point, point. Oh, and really? that's why I want to I Ooh. want to ask one more question before okay. we go to the panel. We have a few uh, folks on the panel waiting to okay. uh, ask you guys some questions. Thank you, Shiloh. You so we now. have Joseph returning, and Thank you. Uh, did you finish that thought, Sesh, or it just the idea of uh, what I, you know, I found it fascinating all this about the. Um, the empty sets being mm-hmm. divided and all that. Uh, but my thought was, well, this is a dream of a mind. The mind is making these separations. And mm-hmm. that I could understand. Uh, it, would, it would not be a material process. Uh, mm-hmm. and It isn't. And so <laughs> ultimately, because of that, I, my view of things is everything is a dream, a dream in the mind of God, perhaps. Uh, um, what do you say about that, Joseph? Am I mistaken? I have, I have no, idea? I have, I have no objection to it, with the proviso that that dream gives real reality and existence to the other dreams going on. Oh yes, it's a virtual it's, reality. It of, is. It's a both and situation, yeah. not an either or. Um, you know oh. the the old the old saying in in the Apostles' Creed is, and I believe in the communion of saints. Well, what is that? Yes, it's everybody having their dream. Hmm. It's everybody being okay. real and making their yes. own choices. Yes. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, uh, before we go to the panel, I want to bring them in. But before we do, mm-hmm. I want to put this one question to both of you. Okay. Uh, we've discussed the who in terms of uh, we, we've just really begun to discuss the who in terms of uh, who, you know, this trans temporal cosmic war, which we will certainly be discussing here at the Walter Bosley channel in future episodes. Mm-hmm. But uh, the other part of the who question is, in your opinions, uh, briefly, um, who in our world today say on the official level? Uh, do you think is aware of this trans temporal cosmic war that we're oh, postulating? Boy. Well, okay. Mm. I think I'll lead with that. I think for, Joseph wants to ruminate on it a bit. Um, not, to, I don't want to step in on you, Joseph. You're you, not. Um, I, I alluded to this earlier. Uh, I was told by somebody back in 1992 about the Mandela effect. Of course, they did not call it that. At that time um, and at the time I did not believe this individual uh, this individual made several claims to me uh, that was just one of many um, but over the years you know since the Mandela effect came about uh, I reassessed what he told me um, I have myself experience the Mandela effect literally because I am one of those people who do remember uh, Mandela dying in the early 1990s. Same here. Okay. So Joseph does. What about you, Walter? Do you remember that? Uh, Specifically not, you know, Mandela's death, but absolutely as as I've discussed with both of you independently, other events. Okay. Other events. I I remember Helen Thomas dying. Yeah. yeah, during yeah, during we uh, that during one. Clinton's so, term in office. The, uh-huh. the the big one for me was, and I can't remember whether it was before or after I had the realization about Mandela. Uh, and at the time, <laughs> let me say, I didn't think anybody else was uh, having this memory. Uh, it was mm-hmm. only quite uh, a few years later where I began to say, "Oh, they're calling it the Mandela effect." And everybody, you know, not everybody, but, you know, large numbers of people were having this memory. Uh, But I also had another one I have uh, actually more memory about, and that was the death of Rod McEwen. Um, Oh, yeah. You're not the only one, Sesh. I have a friend that has said the same thing about the same person. Okay. so You're in good company there. (laughs) uh, So my memory went like this 
Uh, we remember that uh, Rock Hudson died of AIDS. I, I, and I believe that was 1985, isn't it? Wasn't that Somewhere 85? There, yeah. And so it was just a little bit after that happened that uh, on the news, it was Rod McEwen had died. And he had died of lung cancer. And um, I was surprised in this sense that I was always under the impression that he was gay and that, you know, if he died at an early age, uh, maybe he died of AIDS like Rock Hudson did. And mm -hmm. uh, that was my thought. I said, no, he didn't. He died of lung cancer. Um, and that was that. And I assumed Rod uh, McEwen was dead for a long, long time uh, until I heard, you know, I, I can't remember what year it was, just a few years ago, Rod McEwen has died. And I said, what? No, he died of lung cancer way back in the 1980s. No, he died of uh, complications from pneumonia. It's interesting that it is still a lung illness. This indicates something about the what we're calling the Mandela effect is that it's not capricious. Um, there's a pattern to the thing. Uh, and so it has to do with the similarities of that that uh, uh, what's happening is it's a resonant is what I'm trying to get yeah. at. You know, it's a resonant type of phenomenon. In other words, uh, when the other event happens, there's some similarity involved there. And this is, you know, what I'm referring to with the uh, the, the time uh, harmonics that I refer to uh, that. Uh, it's analogical, yes, and uh, and it, but it is, uh, you know, in in sound harmonics, you have the principle of the scale, you know, the do re mi scale of eight, you know. Uh, it seems to me, okay, in what I've studied of the time harmonics, is that the nine figures in very uh, significantly. And that's not to say that eight doesn't figure into it as well. But there seems to be this organizing principle of nine where the, an the analogies fall with a structure of nine. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, you know, I've read a lot of debunking about the Mandela effect, um, and it doesn't hold water for me. It, it reminds me very much of the UFO debunking, uh, mm -hmm. the very heavy handed stuff out of the 60s, the swamp gas explanations. People have right. been drinking, you know, anything they can pull out well, of the bag, you know. Sesh, and, would you say that yeah. people that are experiencing the Mandela effect are those who are sensing the that there has been a transtemporal conflict or activity going on? Is that I think so. Where you're because I think that there is an element of anxiety they're in these they're experiences. sensing that these these timelines are shifting. Uh, Joseph, yes. what what do you think on the who would know? Um, or does know? No, I, I think I think you can you can narrow it down to certain types of groups. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there are people within the more hierarchical ritualistic churches that know. Okay. I think there are definitely people in the field of finance and economics that know. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. particularly of people that view things in terms of long wave, and I mean very long wave cycles. I think okay. they know. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that there are people in the intelligence agencies, particularly in those departments that are handling propaganda or, you know, Let's say let's say the CIA has an Operation Mockingbird department. If there's a particular place in that particular agency that I would look for people like that to know something, that would be the place. Okay. My I think source. There, I yes. think there are people in CERN that yes, know, uh, that are Joseph, heavily involved. Joseph, do you think that CERN might be involved with this phenomenon? Good Let me question. put it this way. Uh, I have I have gone on record many times in interviews and in my website vid chats, not only on what I think is happening with Mandela Effect, but with CERN. 
and what my hypothesis has been is you're dealing with a a macro experiment on group observer effect that is being conducted by these types of people and particularly in CERN's case I have I even wrote in my book the third way when I talk about CERN I've written that if you are experimenting with an accelerator that alone just one little aspect of it and and it's not the only aspect I'm concerned with but let's just pick one the enormous powerfully localized magnetic fields in that accelerator I mean they are far beyond the mag local magnetic field of the earth that you would experience anywhere on the planet they are far beyond that now okay. what that means to me is you are going to upset the electrical cavity or you're going to be able to affect the electrical cavity of the planet in some form or fashion through sheer resonance alone and through sheer resonance alone you might even be affecting by the coupling of the magnetosphere to that of the sun you might even be affecting the sun but wow. as you are tinkering with the electrical cavity of the earth to such a degree you are also going to be running experiments on are there social or human behavioral correlations of statistical activity and please note the term statistical that correlate with this thing being turned on or at such and such a power and so on. These are the types of experiments I think they have been secretly running in CERN. Mm -hmm. And I do think that the Mandela effect is itself a, a mega experiment on what can we do? Can we observe actual physical system state changes if we tinker with a timeline that has a massive group effect. Yes. And the answer and, yeah, is, I think, yes. Yes. And I just add no. real briefly that the source I spoke to did give a picture that a lot of people knew about this already. And mm -hmm. uh, so what Joseph said is right on target, uh, that it is an open secret at the top. And a lot of yes, people I would in, agree. in leadership positions know about it. And mm, totally. the propaganda machine is in place to yeah. buffer the effect and yep. to yeah. debunk it. Yep. 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 I would agree. Well, folks, as if I didn't give you star power enough, <laughs> we've brought in an amazing panel who want to jump right into this discussion with you, Joseph and Sesh. And I want to introduce them all the way from Costa Rica. We have researcher, author, um, Bruce McDonald here, and I'm excited to have him here big time. Welcome, Bruce. Um, we, we have uh, Jeremy Rice, also known as Alien Scientist, uh, 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 someone you're all familiar with. And we have uh, Nano Girl, who um, those of you who are, you know, in the uh, Kev Baker Show audience will know Nano Girl. And of course, she has her own. Uh, presence out there and own show we're welcome to have her and, and and of course we have Ryder Lee host of Raised by Giants and you know what I'm going to uh, open this up to the panel welcome all of you on the panel it's good to see you and uh, we'll um, we'll go with uh, I'll start with I'll be I'll, you know because I was a boy scout so we'll start with ladies first we'll go with Nano Girl um, Nano Girl how you doing I'm doing great. Thank you very much for inviting me today. This is amazing. Well, sure. Well, th thanks for being here. And all of you, this was on really short notice, so I appreciate you uh, being here. Um, Nano Girl, uh, what, uh, what question would you throw at uh, Sesh and Joseph on this topic of trans-temporal warfare and related issues? Um, well, one of the things that I thought a lot about, and I, Joseph, I listened to all of your shows. I really enjoyed them. Um, and Sesh, I just got introduced to you, so I'm going to be listening more and paying attention more, is um, you spoke about the pyramids and it being a major weapon when they were at the, you know, when they were built and they were being used that way. And then since then, they've been gutted and the things that made them work are no longer there. When you were doing your research, did you 
think that maybe planet earth was like a weapon station that that we were set up just to be used at because it's such a powerful weapon and that it was manipulated perhaps on a different planet and then the second part of my question in this might go to cern and all of the things that they're doing um again in your research I guess the thing that I'm still struggling with is why would you, you know, use this weapon in space and time when you made, let's, so let's just say I'm a leader and I decided to, to use this, but a year from now I decide, oh, that was not a good idea, but I've already used it and it's already on its way. Do I have the option of stopping that because it was in the future? or you know th that those kind of implications to me you know i woke up at two o'clock in the morning and i'm thinking well here's the question here's the question anyway so mm -hmm. let me throw those out well first of all you have to understand that that my weapon hypothesis for the great pyramid first of all it's not my hypothesis it's actually zechariah sitchin's i'm simply exploring something that i found a fascinating idea that he just kind of tossed out there and forgot about you know uh, he wrote a book about it, but he never really pursued the idea itself. Uh, now, you have to understand that that means that I view the Great Pyramid as sui generis. It's, it's a one-off. It's, it's, a, it's a structure that is so unique and so very carefully engineered that no other pyramidal structure on the planet comes even remarkably close to it and there's a lot of other remarkable pyramidal structures out there so i view it as kind of a one-off that that yes does have weapons missing now the the real central part of your question is does that hypothesis mean that the planet itself was weaponized to a certain extent and yes that is exactly the implication uh and it's not and again, this is not a new hypothesis. Um, there was a Roman Catholic nun by the name of Valerie Bertinelli, I think was her name, that many years ago wrote a book about the weaponization of the planet. And this was her whole whole thesis, that somehow, you know, the, the defense people are so mad that they're trying to weaponize the planet. And that ultimately is what I think is behind climate change. I think climate change is the narrative they've put out to disguise the fact that they have weaponized geophysics and that they've weaponized the weather. So, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with your, your hypothesis there. Uh, why use it? Could they, could they retract its use? Uh, that's a good question. My, my, my thinking at this point, based on, on the hypothesis as I've developed it, is that, yes, they could, but once once you set a harmonic like that out there, you'd you'd literally have to create something literally 180 degrees out of phase with everything in that harmonic in order to to nullify the effect. But basically the basic idea is there. It's it's just like jamming a radio signal. You have to you have to have something on the same frequency but completely out of phase. And you know, if that's the case, then you hear nothing. So, yeah, it could be done, in my opinion. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to Bruce next. What mm -hmm. I'm going to do with the panel, I want to make sure I'm going to go to each one so that each member of the panel gets a question in, and then we're just going to open those mics and go open for them. So you guys will be able to shoot those questions out there and interact more. But let's go to Bruce McDonald. Um, let me see. I'm trying to... Ah, oh, Bruce, go ahead and unmute yourself. You unmuted? Ah, having a little trouble here. Let me get my producer back in here to. I think I double have me Oh, there, there we go. go. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm Bruce, back. go go right ahead. Ask uh, <laughs> ask your first question. All right. Well, I mean, it's been an absolutely uh, fascinating discussion. Um. When I look at the biblical cosmology, I um, I associate it more with the um, the constituent parts of a human being. So, 
the part of a human being most like Lucifer, I think, is the mind, which is why saints are so simple. <laughs> but I have a question to open, and I, I, I'd like to hear Joe go on this first. Oh, by the way, Joe, did you quit smoking? No. Okay, um, pe people are under that impression because I'm not chugging cigarettes on camera. <laughs> but but the reason I'm not chugging cigarettes on camera is I don't want the stress of people lecturing me about about <laughs> smoking causing the heart attack. I honest as much as I smoke, I don't inhale. To me, it's just a way of keeping my sinus dry. So I'm not you know I'm not chugging that stuff into my lungs. But I, I just got so tired of everybody lecturing me about the cigarettes. I you know I I smoke a cigarette you know at least at least once a day. Uh, so no, I didn't quit smoking just to let everybody know. <laughs> Except my cardiologist who probably will never watch this. <laughs> okay. So yeah, my, my, what is the significance of the number 40 in the Abrahamic scriptures? Oh golly. I don't, I don't know right off the top of my head. There's there's so much there's so much about gematria out there and numerology out there. It depends on who you'd ask, but right off the top of my head I can't pull anything out. Yeah, you've got what, what is he 40 asking days about in the, in the Abrahamic scriptures? Are you talking about the Old Testament? Well, I mean Abrahamic would include everything from uh, Adam to Muhammad, I guess, would yes. be Abrahamic. Yeah. Okay. So just, you know, let me just give so you a few examples. You got 40 years in sure. the desert, you've got 40, uh, 40 days in the desert, 40 years in the desert for the Hebrew mm -hmm. people, 40 mm -hmm. days in the cave for Muhammad. So I just, mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, because a lot of the discussion was about time and numbers, uh, I would open with that. And it didn't come to me until uh, Joseph said that he was Eastern Orthodox. Mm -hmm. I, I myself was, was raised Roman Catholic, but have significantly mm -hmm. deviated from that path. Uh, but look, the thing about the 40 is what I came up with, and it's quite interesting. So there's 28 days in a lunar cycle. Mm -hmm. And so you add 12 to get 40 because the base calendar for the Abrahamic system is lunar, not solar. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the Christians have sort of come into the middle of this with a solar system in between two lunar systems. And the mm -hmm. Mohammedans, the the Islam, they double down on the lunar, and even in the in, in the crown symbol for the for the. He's breaking in and out. He's breaking up. Oh, uh, yeah, he's down in Costa Rica, so we might unfortunately experience a, a bit of this technical uh, glitches beyond really his bad. control. Okay. Yeah, sorry. We can about hear that. you. I so, think. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, it, maybe it'll be better with the camera off. I don't know. I've got okay. To, yeah, well, you're sounding really good. Go ahead. Okay, so usually I don't have these problems, but this this is the worst time of day because I live way up in the mountains, and there's only one tower, mm -hmm. and all the kids are out of school yeah. and they're on their cell phones, and it's just uh, right. It's just insanity. I I, I can get up to like a uh, hundred megabits per second after like nine o'clock mm -hmm. at night, but. Uh, Oh, wow. So, and now the dog is going. I don't think I'm meant to speak on this show. Um, so, 40 to so 28 days is the lunar cycle. Uh, you add 12, you get 40. 40 divided by 12 is three decimal three repeating into infinity. Okay. Now, if you take 40 and you divide it by 12, a calculator will give you 39.6. If you take 40 and you divide it by three decimal three repeating nine times, it'll give you 40. So you've got that, you know, 369 Tesla system there in the middle of the 40. So my theory is that these are escape or these are nodal points for consciousness to escape the constraints of time. Because in the Abrahamic scriptures, they're all related to a contemplative or penitent process mm -hmm. so the well it's it's not really penance when the jews are in the desert they have to shake off the conscious slavery mm -hmm. 
but it's uh, quite a master. And Mohammed went in deep to, I guess, consolidate his relationship with uh, his uh, co-writer, the Archangel Michael, or Gabriel, sorry. So I, I found that really interesting that 40 is, is so pivotal to this. But I think at the end of the day, as, as much as I like erudite conversation as much as the next person, I've chosen the contemplative path. I meditate a couple hours a day and have been doing so for decades. And really, I think the way the creator set it up is you can, you can escape it, but you can't pass the secret on to anybody. This is, this is the trick of this system we're locked into. Interesting. And um, if you wanted to get my opinion on, and I know we're supposed to be asking questions, but I'm an arrogant bastard, so I'm just gonna give my opinions. <laughs> Um, why man was created. There's, there's more um, than one here, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Why man was created, I would say that we're a kind of resolution to a problem that existed in species prior to us. We're kind of like God's ultimate soldier. And we, we actually take on the most negative things in the universe. So uh, I will share a little bit bit more with you. I had the wonderful opportunity to write a book with a gentleman by the name of John Edmonds, who lived at a ranch in Buckeye, Arizona, that is more off the charts paranormally than Skinwalker. And the reason he never got a TV show is he was a very prickly personality. He uh, passed away February 28th last Did we lose you, Bruce? I think we lost him. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm going to bring in uh, Jeremy Rice, alien scientist. Let me, uh, Walter, before you do that, yeah. let me put in my two cents here about mm -hmm. uh, Br Bruce McDonald's. Is he coming back on? It looks like. We don't know. Okay. Uh, I want to uh, speak about what he was saying about 40 Okay. He, he wanted to know something about it. Um, I um, I don't know if he can hear me or not, but uh, I can. Um, oh, okay. oh, there he is. Oh, okay. you're back, Bruce. Go, go ahead, Seth. You go ahead, Bruce. Oh, yeah. Well, so in, in the course of working on this book, the unique thing about the portal at John's Ranch. Now, whatever you may think about these stories i mean this was bona fide uh the cia tried to take it away from them bigelow tried to take it away from them there's there's definitely something going on on that ranch but what the interesting thing and i did a lot of uh, background research to understand the phenomenon better and so i looked at skinwalker and that's just been commodified so much with the tv people that it's almost impossible to get any good data out of it. But then I took a look at Bradshaw. Now here's an interesting thing about Bradshaw. So a portal would open and a raptor would come out like from the Paleolithic age, you know, or, or the age of dinosaurs, a raptor would come out. Now you might say, okay, well that is, maybe you're seeing that astrally. Maybe it's an amplification of the astral. Your physical eyes can suddenly bring the astral into frequency. But the raptor moves around for a little while, goes back into the portal and... And you... We get some breaking up again. Sorry about but that, But he doesn't Bruce. want that out. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Maybe he's talking a little too too much there about uh, in some true things. Um Okay, you back with us, Bruce? Yeah, yeah I really us? do apologize. Oh, no, no I, worries. I don't we, know if I am. Yeah, you you're know, breaking up. Podcast this. Okay, let me. I think it's like you say, the time of day that we uh, threw this at you. Um, <laughs> you know, I we totally understand. Totally understand. Are you still, are you back with us? Okay. Okay, well, I'll tell you what, let's go ahead and jump to Jeremy Rice, alien scientist. Jeremy, welcome. Thank you so much for short notice doing this. And like I said, after Jeremy and after Ryder gets one in, we're going to go to an open forum. So it'll be a little more loose. So Jeremy, welcome. And uh, what's your question for our guests? Um, 
I had a couple of them, right? The last one I had was about this um, pyramid idea that it was a, a weapon system of some kind. Is that, is that related to, um, I know that another book I read by Christopher Dunn called The Geese of Power Plant. And yes. That it was a power plant of some kind that, you know, did that. It is, it is directly related. Um, I know Mr. Dunn, uh, have met him, talked with him at a couple of conferences um, he just published a new book too. Um, yeah, well, he published I think three so far. But he, um, let's put it this way: when you read my pyramid books, all four of them, I make heavy reference to Mister Dunn, and the reason why, and I even try to point out the strengths and weaknesses of the two different hypotheses as much as I can. The great strength of his approach is that he views the entire structure as an engineer and he does not have any uh, textual reference in that book. It's solely a book examining the structure with an engineer's eye. He is not appealing to any Egyptian text, Babylonian text, or anything like that. And that's simultaneously its great strength and great weakness. Uh, you can't get around it. The weapon hypothesis comes out of kind of a blend of an engineering approach, a physics approach, and looking at texts. So that's the chief difference between the two. Sorry, I had my cough button on my mute. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, writer, what's your uh, first question? And then after this, we'll go into that open forum, and you guys can just have at these guys. Writer? Thanks so much for having me on. It's been, uh, I've been listening since the beginning, and uh, good to see you, Joseph, Sheesh, um, Walter, Nano Girl, Bruce, and Alien Scientist. Appreciate you guys a lot. So, Dr. Farrell, you've been mentioning that these uh, megalithic structures, and specifically the Giza pyramid, is a uh, a weapon system of sort. And let me not, stop you. Let me stop you. I have never said the other pyramids are part of a weapon system. They may be, right? But I have not said that. Um, I have hinted in a couple of books that they might be. But the weapon hypothesis, I, I point this out once again, the weapon hypothesis is restricted to the Great Pyramid. And the reason why is it is a sui generis structure. Even when you compare it to all the massive engineering in the other pyramids, it by far excels all of them. So it, I, I approach that structure as a unique object that can function in that fashion with or without other other pyramids. And it, with that caveat, go ahead. Yes, that is serves multi purposes, right? Well, so, it can, but but again, I don't think you can build a structure based on the kind of physics that I'm proposing may have been behind it without realizing that you're building a weapon. In other words, the weapon function is is coming directly out of a highly unified type of physics and that it cannot be avoided. It's, it's the same idea really behind Tesla's wireless power. Eventually the beans were spilled and Morgan pulled the plug. And I think he pulled the plug contrary to the popular story that he couldn't meter it. I think he pulled the plug because he realized that what Tesla was building was a weapon and could be used without any modification in that capacity. And Tesla himself later admitted it. So the last time you were on my show, Dr. Farrell, we were talking about this weaponization of space and the militarization mm -hmm. of space. And I want to get your thoughts on if there could be one of these structures, one of these pyramidal structures mm -hmm. on the moon or on Mars or other planetary bodies in our mm -hmm. solar system. And those could be connected to the structures that we have on earth and what sure. that would mean. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can have them anywhere, 
anywhere where you are constructing a system that relies on a pyramid as a coupled harmonic oscillator of the planet it's on. And once you say that, once you've said that, then you're using an entire planet, quite literally, as, as kind of, so to speak, the antenna in such a system. Remember what Tesla did. He flipped the circuit of standard radio broadcast so that the antenna wasn't something sticking up from the earth. The antenna was the earth and the ground part of the circuit was the atmosphere. <laughs> he just flipped it. And then what if it's not that there are structures on the moon? What if the moon is that structure? What if Could the be. moon is that uh, device that is like what we've built Could on be. the planet? Yeah. yeah, I mean the moon. The moon has such weird properties. You know, when you get right down to it, it has such weird properties that that you know. I think the the old Soviet article. Uh, it appeared in Sputnik, I think, in the seventies in the Soviet Union and in the English language version of Sputnik, because I remember a friend of mine subscribed to Sputnik and I read the, I read the article over at his house. Well, the article is titled, is the moon a spaceship? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was, this was, seri this was the serious discussion in the Soviet Union uh, about what the moon is. So could it be? Yeah, sure. Well, folks, we've been here just for the viewers and those who might have jumped in recently. We've been here for a couple of hours, and uh, we are discussing the question, uh, could, we, could there be a trans-temporal cosmic war going on? And so we're going to an open forum with our uh, panel here uh, to per continue pursuing this uh, topic. So, um, panel, I invite you to just... Jump in with uh, your questions to uh, Seshari and Dr. Farrell. Um, and so in, in talking about that, um, I'm really glad you brought up the Mandela effects and CERN and the testing. And it's, I, there's no way I can prove this, but I often get a sense that the people who are ever running things from behind the scenes have a foreknowledge of how things are going to roll out and how we're going to respond. And I don't know if it's because they're on, they're using AI and they're, they, they, they have a million responses. So they, you know, plug in the question and they get lots and lots of responses or do they have access somehow to the future and that it, it can go out and test it and bring it back and say, go these directions, not these three. So does that strictly AI in this time zone or can they go out a little bit into the future and do they have that technology? Because I've always felt like they have some kind of knowledge, foreknowledge of, of reaching into the future somehow and then having it ping back and go, nope, that doesn't, but this worked. Are you asking me or Sesh? Anybody. Um. I, I definitely think that they have some sort of technology that they are using to game out the future. And the reason I think that it might be AI-based is because if you look at the policy decisions that they're making, they are inhuman and anti-human. So in other words... Yeah. It looks to me like if you want confirmation of, of an AI being the direction behind the technocrats and politicians, just look at their policy. That, to me, is what gives the game away. That said, let's go back to what the ancient texts say about astrology, and let's remember why bankers have joined the Society for the Study of Cycles, which incidentally was a society created under the Hoover administration in this country. And it kept massive amounts of data. If you look at the ancient text and what they say about astrology, they, they will tell you that these were their, their astrological predictions were based on observations taken over tens of thousands of years. Uh, 
So in other words, what they're telling you is that at one time there was an empirical and statistical basis for what they were doing. And let's also remember that astrology back then was not the little booklet that you got on the sun sign in the grocery grocery store aisle that you open up and you read all about your personal future. No. What it was, was they were making what a modern astrologer would call a mundane horoscope. They were making a prediction for a king or a queen, and therefore for a whole group of people. In other words, they were, again, basing this on a statistical, empirical point of view. So in other words, do I think that there are people now gaming out with super sophisticated computer programs, these types of predictions? Yes, I do. Are they basing policy on it? I think they are. Uh, Look at how screwed up our markets are, nano girl. Every single market that you and I can think of, stock market, equities market, commodities market, you name it, it's all being driven by computer algorithms now. Do those trades therefore reflect a human assessment of risk and price? Answer, no, they're programmed assessments. They're very different than what you and I would do. And guess who's behind all of that? Well, quantum physicists that couldn't get degree or couldn't get teaching positions or research positions back in the 80s entered, entered the stock markets and began to write these algorithms for computer trading based on quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, talk about nutty. Um, <laughs> I could speak to that question a little sure. bit. Uh, I would say everything Joseph had to say on it, I agree with him. Um, There's a couple of other factors I believe are in play here. Um, Some of this I'm going to be putting in a future book. And like Joseph, you know, I don't want to give all my little goodies away here at this time. But I will say one of the things I've discovered is... Uh, a decoding of a monument, a very, very significant monument that I believe encodes spans of time that the ancient Egyptians knew about and that this knowledge has been transmitted up to our present era. And it involves large spans of time Uh, that you could look at as a timeline for sociological action, for um, large migrations of populace, et cetera, of when to do what, when to go where. And um, the monument encodes some basic timelines in regard to that. Uh, And the way that monument was handled in the 19th century and moved uh, (laughs) marks the timeline along with when it was first uh, erected and it's evidence of a knowledge of time spans that the ruling elite of earth know about and use to set their policies So this is also involved with um, all the things that's happening now with artificial intelligence. Um, They are applying artificial intelligence to ancient knowledge and magnifying the power of that knowledge. And one more thing I'll add in here. I don't know how our panel views the whole subject of ET. I don't like to use the term ET. Uh, for a number of reasons I won't go into, but I call them non-humans because I want to keep it uh, general and generic, and I don't want to load the term with a lot of um, false ideas, which something like ET immediately might give false ideas embedded in that. So I will just say there is an off-planet, off-dimension factor to knowledge about reality. Uh, In other words, we do not uh, live in a closed system. Our civilization 
actually is not human. We do not live in a human civilization. We live in a legacy civilization. It's been given to us and it's continuing to be managed by off-planet intelligence, off-dimension uh, intelligence. That's the source of the management. And the artificial intelligence is something that has been given to us for the very purpose of us magically uh, processing ourselves alchemically. Um, I, I'm writing a book on this, but um, I just want to say the whole issue of what's going on on our planet is complicated and well, it involves very many uh, converging factors. Let me add something, Sesh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if everybody remembers a few years ago, Elon Musk said something that ties directly to what Sesh just said, because what Sesh is saying is that AI is is the new interface mechanism between management and this planet, <laughs> okay, effectively. Yeah. Well, Elon Musk many years ago, remember, said, I worry about AI because it might transduce or pull in some being from out there. And once it does, will we ever be able to get rid of it? So, yeah. yeah. And not only pull in, but how about that that being actually planted the ideas of AI? I don't doubt it. People. I, don't, I, I don't have any difficulty and, with that. And I'll have to say this also. Now, of course, Joseph, you know all about Tesla, but I don't know about the rest of the panel or uh, particularly our, our, our uh, viewers in general, they, uh, most people don't know about how the alternating current uh, system came into existence. It's very strange how it came into existence. Mm -hmm. uh, it did not come into existence by peer reviewed study and <laughs> uh, controlled, mm -hmm. uh, blind, uh, controlled uh, experiments and all that. No, it did it's not. It's supposed to be the scientific method. Nothing like that. It was more like a religious revelation. It was an epiphany. <laughs> it was a, an epiphany, exactly. Uh, and so what was the source of that epiphany? Tesla was just a man, but it seems to me he was more of a medium of, he was a transducer of, of knowledge from some other source. Um, and I hint at this, I wrote a trilogy of novels about Tesla, Wonder of the Worlds trilogy, and mm -hmm. I hint at this throughout the trilogy that there is some outside influence behind Tesla, which I symbolize as a character called the man in the silk hat. And uh, uh, this is my idea that our technology has been given to us, first of all, uh, long ago. Well, let's go back. It was given to us in the form of the gift of fire, as in the Promethean legend. And then it was given to us again with the introduction of the wheel. Did humans invent the wheel? I don't think so. I don't think anybody would be genius enough, completely on their own, to conceive of the wheel. It's such an elegant concept, but I do not believe humanity is smart enough to do that. It was given to us. And again and again, uh, technology was given to us. So it wasn't just a case of what Zechariah Sitchin's talking about with uh, the Sumerian civilization which there were many gifts involved with that civilization, but it, it's been an ongoing thing. And it's, and it's coming from a very high kind of intelligence because um, what I'm postulating here is an intelligence spanning millions of years, literally, and certainly mm. hundreds of thousands of years with man, sure. introduction of fire, the wheel, et cetera. And then you have the Sumerian civilization right. and um, on up to the 20th century and the development of the computer uh, 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 and before that with Tesla. Uh, well, when, I'm seeing a process that it's an outside influence that's uh, gifting our civilization, creating mm -hmm. it and managing it. 
Yeah. Well, when you're talking about epiphanies and almost spiritual level, it, it, this makes me think of, you know, kind of where Bruce was going. Bruce, what do you think about what session? Well, I mean, said? it's it's not you, you you guys are such eggheads. You bring everything into a scientific paradigm. It's not just science <laughs> and math. I mean, where did traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine come from? We know where Western medicine came from. The ghoul called Da Vinci was digging up fresh corpses and dissecting them. And he was a master etcher. So so we got anatomy, mm -hmm. which springboarded the allopathic medical system. So explain to me how the internal med medical systems, how could the Chinese preserve, uh, pre interpret the energy going through the body, the chi? How, how could the yogis uh, uh, interpret the, prani? Okay. Well, Bruce, they had, they had some very ancient knowledge from high civilizations. That's one thing. But I'd also like to bring up the issue of the... And excuse me, I'm not going to get the pronunciation of this word, well, keep, ayahuasca. You, you keep, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but it's important okay. that I do it at this point because we're, we're entering into a... Yep. Lost think we're... Yeah, Bruce, we didn't hear that we're entering into is where you cut off. So I like the idea they this took... This is unbelievable. I'm connections that makes sense to me you know <laughs> i like that where you were going with that last so i don't know why i cut out at all the integral points as well but um by the way i do a podcast from this mountain and i have no technical problems um, right yeah yeah well it's it, so it, believe I, I me would, i would i would make the You're, suggestion to move mm -hmm. i think zoom is a better tool well, that I'll talk I, I, about that with the uh, with the producer. We'll we'll figure out the 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 technical options. We um, it it's you know it's it, we, you go to Zoom and then there's issues there. So stream Streamyard's working pretty good, but um, uh, has been. But uh, it, it uh, you know you're you're with a group here that doesn't also you know that also considers the possibility that you know. Maybe you're saying stuff somebody doesn't want heard, <laughs> or doesn't want people thinking about, you know. So funny how it, no, it breaks up at I, just I, the right I, time. I just, I I just want to make sure that this last point is taken and it gets out clearly. Yes. So yes. Sesh, you keep promoting this idea of a knowledge torch passing, okay? Mm -hmm. But I I, yes. I would I I think epiphany, intuition, and the Tesla model of divine knowledge is much more important, and we all do it well, in I, our lives. We've all yes, used, I, I we've agree. All used I, I, intuition. It's it's part of a bigger picture. I agree with what you're saying, uh, and I was going to add to that um, uh, the ayahuasca drug in South America. Um, that's a whole subject to itself. Um, that knowledge of medicine came from shaman drinking this drug and having direct interaction with non-human intelligence who gave them knowledge of various medicinal herbs and plants in South America. And they have this huge pharmacological knowledge of plants. How did they get it? Well, they say we got it from drinking the drug and talking to the entities. And uh, I think that's well, okay. you know okay, hold on. valid. You got you 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 actually got that wrong. The knowledge of, okay. on that was brought to us by Na by National Geographic's explorer in yeah. residence, a Canadian guy, by the name yeah. of Wade Davis. Okay, he was one. He of went the over guys. there with a bunch of eggheads from Ivy League school. Am I breaking up again? Nope. Go ahead. Okay. So Wade Davis went over and lived in the rainforest, and then after what he saw was going on, he brought over some, some chemists and postdoctoral fellows from Ivy League schools in the United States. They literally could not believe what these shamans were doing because the yeah. formula to create ayahuasca is so refined, both, both in terms of the preparation of the material, the quantities, the temperature of the fire, it, like you would be, the, what the scientists noted is that it would be difficult to replicate in a controlled laboratory with a Bunsen burner, and the shamans were doing yeah. it over coals. <clears throat> and so, right, you, you said the shaman drank the liquid and spoke. Well, how did they how did they get the recipe to drink the to make the liquid? So it's a good Wade question. Davis, well, Wade David Wade Davis asked them, and you know what they said? Yes. 
What? The plants speak to us in our dreams. Yes, mm -hmm. I believe that's true. Okay. All right. Yes. Yes, the dreams are another pathway. This is what I'm saying, Bruce, that if you want to look at the big picture, there are all kinds of pathways to knowledge. And this, these are some of the pathways and, uh, and uh, re direct knowledge is there. And uh, I'm fully aware of that. I've had my own personal experiences with the direct knowledge and uh, I have a great deal of respect for it. I do also have a respect for something they call the scientific method, but it really doesn't exist. There is no such thing as the scientific method. Uh, it's a myth. Um, there are various strategies of testing that scientists use, um, and people assume, oh, they have this thing, that scientific method, and you do you do this little formula and you come, uh, you get truth out of that, but well, it's not that way at all. I get the, the, the antecedent of formula is ritual. And, and we're getting very truth. close to yeah. that point. Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke spoke about where you're not going to be able to tell the difference between magic and science. Right. Right. So it, it, it it's coming full circle, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, ritual is a sequence of steps timed, right? It could be a lunar right. timing. You know, it's in blood magic, it's in chaos magic, it's in everything. And then basically we get the scientific method out, out of magic. And so science yes. is an extension of magic in many ways, right? Yes, it is. And you got the two principal uh, languages. You, you have our linguistic structures. We use spoken language to release energy, to express our emotions and our ideas. We use math to contain energy. So the numerical language is box energy in which explains why the universe is mathematical. Well, and you know, the split, Bruce, the split occurred with Sir Isaac Newton, who was both an alchemist and, as they claim, the first scientist. So what he did was he stripped all of the intuitive and consciousness aspects of what you're talking yeah. about in magic, and bottled it up in the Principia Mathematica. So, um, you know, there's all kind of pathways to truth. And I respect those pathways, but what I don't respect is the pseudo pathways where people make claims that they have had some kind of revelation when they have not. And then we get the Jim Jones and we get the Heaven's Gate and we get all kinds of terrible cults and false belief systems and new age belief systems that don't hold water. We have to use our reasoning minds. I have a great respect for the reasoning mind as a check and balance on all forms of information. And to just say, uh, I'm just going to go with intuition and revelation and forget that other stuff. I think it's a huge mistake. <laughs> Well, I, well, I, well Jeremy, I never said. Oh, go it, ahead, Bruce. I never said. I never said it was. It was the be all and end all, but it needs yes. to be integrated into rational processes. Yeah, it needs exactly. to. Be, it needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. That is and, true. And you know, every everybody. You know, I live in a rather primitive society now. I I'm so far up into the jungle. My neighbors are cave, a, a Cabercar tribe, which is a traditional living Central American tribe, and um, I. I can tell you that nobody thinks like us, okay? And I, I lived in Taiwan from 92 to 94, and the Chinese, they can get the engineering degrees and everything, but they don't let go of the other stuff. That, you know, it's not, it, there's, there's, there's no conflict for them. They can remain Buddhist and, and Taoist and continue on in the rationalist side. What we've done is in the West, in the West is we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. OK, mm -hmm. and, and, yes. and it's produced basically this this cult culture we now live in, dominated by sexual dysphoria, chaos, fiscal irresponsibility. And as uh, Dr. Farrell has referred to a couple of times, outright genocide at this point. And these are the yes. these are the natural consequences of boxing yourself into a rational subject object methodology for culture. You, you kill the soul when you do that. And the gateway to the soul yes. is imagination. 
Yes, oh, I agree yeah, with true. you, Bruce. True. I true. think that's very true. Yeah. Jeremy, I know that uh, in the last several <laughs> minutes, Bruce, Sesh, Joseph, we, there's been a number of things hit on that I know I can just guess from your perspective. You've got a couple of questions. Um, well, one thing I wanted to say about Sesh, uh, Newton was the first physicist. Da Vinci was actually considered the first scientist, I believe. So, um, but Newton hey, was... I don't know the difference. Can you explain that to me? What's the difference between a physicist and a scientist? Maybe well, Joseph a scientist is, uh, generally looks at all, all science. Oh, um, so physicist. now you're saying Da Vinci was the first physicist? Is that what no, I'm no, hearing? No. Newton was the first physicist. Oh, he you was said, the first physicist. You said Newton was the first scientist, but I think... Well, I've heard him. Well, I, I didn't say that. Uh, I'm just quoting others who have said that, and many have said that, that Newton was the first scientist, okay? Uh, and if you want to specify it and say he was the first physicist, I have no problem with that, you know? But uh, da Vinci was not a scientist or a physicist. What he was was a mechanic, and he was a genius, but he was not using something you could call the scientific method exactly. He was using reasoning, um, but in my opinion about uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who I think was an extraordinary individual, um, most of his of the inventions that um, are ascribed to him, particularly out of the Codex Atlanticus, were not his inventions. They were a legacy from literally Atlantis, what we call Atlantis. Um, and there, and I'm going to go into this in my book, but I'll say it here for your benefit and others that uh, uh, a thing happened back in the early 20th century when they were going through the Codex Atlanticus, they came upon a page in it uh, and they realized that it had been glued together. Uh, do you know this story, Joseph? Uh, vaguely. Okay, well, I'll go on then. Uh, this page, uh, when they pried it apart, there was a drawing on the back of the paper. Uh, you know, paper was expensive back then, and they they didn't throw paper away, you know. And if you scribbled something on a piece of paper and it was blank on the other side, you're going to use it. And Da Vinci found a piece of paper that had something drawn on the other side, and he used it. And then he glued it into the Codex Atlanticus. In other words, he was saying, whatever's on the other side is not important. It's just scribbling. Well, what it was was a drawing of a bicycle chain driven bicycle but it had a lot of problems with it um, for example the chain the the links in the chain were square instead of round they couldn't move uh, the steering wheel was rigid it was made all of one piece it couldn't turn you couldn't steer this bicycle and you couldn't move it forward with the chain drive because it couldn't work and uh, somebody had done, did a drawing of this. Now, in every other respect, that bicycle looked like a perfectly good bicycle of the 19th century when bicycles started being built and uh, developed. And they realized, well, this was, was not Da Vinci who drew this. They figured out, they assumed it was Salai, one of uh, Da Vinci's assistants. And that's the way they dismissed it. But... What I think happened was uh, it was a, an assistant of da Vinci who made this drawing. But what he did, he came upon some material that da Vinci had. Now, one might argue that it was an actual drawing that da Vinci did of an uh, invention of the bicycle. Leonardo da Vinci invents the bicycle, the chain-driven bicycle. That's one explanation. The other is that da Vinci had access to a secret archive of knowledge. And one of the things he had was a picture of a chain-driven bicycle. And uh, he did not do anything with that. He did a lot of other things with other drawings that he had. He tried to build models of these other drawings. 
And this is what grew out, created the Codex Atlanticus. But the bicycle went by the wayside. So Salai comes along and he tries to copy the drawing. But he does, he's never seen a bicycle before. He doesn't know how it works. He doesn't understand it. So he just draws the shapes. But he gets some of the shapes wrong as someone copying, not understanding what they're drawing would do. So he, he, he gets the chain part right, but he, he gets the links wrong. Instead of round links, he doesn't understand the importance of how it works. So he says, oh, I'll just make them square. And then the, the steering, he doesn't get the idea that that's the steering mechanism, and he just makes that all one piece. In other words, the Codex Atlanticus is the result of a secret archive of knowledge um, that Leonardo da Vinci received from some place that I would speculate may have come out of the Vatican's archives through the Medici's. And they were giving him this information to develop it and to figure out what are we going to develop with this uh, legacy and what are we going to hold back? And it, that was his job to go through that and figure it out. They were planning the future. And so some of those things were trial balloons. He put it out and he named it Codex Atlanticus. Why did he name it that? Because that's what it is. It's from Atlantis. Uh, and so when you're telling me that da Vinci was a scientist or a physicist, I would have to say, no, he was not. He was a mechanic. He was a great artist who I really admire, a very intelligent, talented man. But no, he was not a physicist. He was not of that era when the, when, when the, the, the body of knowledge began to be developed to reason things out and to use mathematics to create models. Uh, it was just forming. Galileo was doing some of this work, you know, with inclined planes and such. But it wasn't until Sir Isaac Newton that uh, you could say that there was really a science. So that's why it's not me saying that Sir Isaac Newton was the first scientist. That is what that is the uh, conventional wisdom of scientific historians. They say Sir Isaac Newton was the first scientist. Well, I knew Newton was the first physicist because he's the first one to take Leibniz's calculus and actually apply it to you know falling bodies and other things like that and show well, that hey, they fall. He, the same. he didn't really take Leibniz's calculus. They were both working on it at the same time. Uh, let me weigh in here, please. Okay. Yes, please do. Um, John Maynard Keynes says, said that Sir Isaac Newton was the last of the Sumerians. Yes. So, yeah, he may have been the first scientist, but he was also the last magician. Yes, I agree. Now, he was, uh, regarding the calculus... Yeah. Uh, let's be very blunt here. No one in the world uses Newton's notation for the calculus. Newton had one, and it's as cumbersome as all get out. And quite frankly, I suspect that the man wasn't being entirely honest. Ah. Okay. Okay. Yes, that's interesting. We do use Leibniz's notation for yeah. the calculus to this day for the very simple reason that Leibniz, like Bruce has been arguing, incorporated in his choice of symbols for the calculus an intuitive approach to the symbol. That's why we use the long S's for summations and so on and so forth. So we still use Leibniz's notation conventions for the calculus. I, I challenge anybody here on the panel or listening, go online and look up Newton's calculus and his notation and try to use it. And then look how Newton solved problems with it. And you will be absolutely dumbfounded at the extra steps involved in trying to manipulate that cumbersome mess. Yeah. Whereas, whereas 
lightness is as elegant and easy and clearly understood as can be. And let's remember something else about Leibniz. Since we're talking about language, Leibniz wanted to invent uh, what he called the Characteristica Universalis, a calculus that was able to obtain by means of an algebra a calculation of things that could not be quantified. Now, this is way beyond symbolic logic in his thinking. He's he's mm -hmm. talking about something I think that uh, approximates my idea of an analogical calculus. I was just going to say that. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what he's... He called it... Yep. He also called it analysis situ, analysis of the situation. Oh, my. Yeah, a topological so, analysis. A topologic, yeah, this guy is way beyond isaac newton yeah <laughs> I just i'm sorry folks well, I, I i'm to... not a newton fan and right and I... one one i'm not done okay one final thing i want to talk about is that if you want to know what newton did that that began the modern world i do agree with you in one major respect newton changes the metaphor of of cosmo of cosmology from organism to mechanism. And if we look at the ancient physics, if you will, if we look at that ancient model of the universe, it's organism, not mechanism. And yep. that has all the... I can't emphasize how profound a change that is. And uh, It's huge. And th I think, you know, you've said it much better than I could, but that's exactly what I was trying to get at. This mechanistic view of the universe is it's what hideous. Uh, Newton uh, introduced. And yep. um, uh, I think that was intentional. And I also think yep. that that was not uh, Newton's doing as an individual. He was a front man for other people. Agreed. Uh, and, um, he, and, you know, he... Um, he all that material, all that those inventions. He's of a Newton's, front man, yeah. meaning no offense to certain individuals here. He's a front man for a secret society that likes to think in terms of building buildings. Yes, <laughs> and, yes, exactly. Okay, and, that's exactly yeah. what he's doing. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what he's yeah. doing. It doesn't yeah. take and, a hobbit and, to figure out that riddle. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't take a hobbit to figure. No, no of course, offense, Walter. Mean that but no, this this is out. this is what he's fronting for. He's fronting for that vision of the world, and I think there is a huge, you know, in terms of our cosmic war hypothesis, a uh, uh, trans-temporal hypothesis. There is a huge culture war going on in Europe at this time. And it's this culture war between the old cosmology, which has its last dying breath in, in the Baroque era, and the new emerging cosmology that you see happening with the Royal Society in England and then forward. And people like Descartes in some kind of weird, uncomfortable middle ground between someone like a Leibniz and someone like a Newton. And then the whole thing, the whole thing by the time you get to the late Enlightenment, you, you have definitely the, the mechanistic people winning out. Um, yeah. Uh, the, it's a huge cultural shift that's going on. Um, you know, and, Bach, and, Bach is not the last, is not the first of the great composers. He's the last of yeah. a long tradition. And then Beethoven is the first of a wholly new thing that you've got going on in, in cosmology. Joseph, uh, I don't know if we have if we have time hmm. for this question, but um, I wanted to ask you your view on Oswald Spangler's um, history. Decline and of the, the West. Yeah, the decline of the West and the thesis. I, I think his thesis was that, you know, the West was in a, you know, the Renaissance ended, and I can't remember when the exact end of that was, but um, I, it seems like uh, Newton was certainly the beginning of the end of the Renaissance. Uh, uh, strangely, you know, people would say, well, that was what the Renaissance was all about, what happened with Newton, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the even uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, his approach to things, there was an intuitive, artistic approach, mm -hmm. 
that's completely absent in Newton. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. I'd like you to uh, address this issue with Newton, what happened to him personally, because I think it kind of destroyed him to promote this mechanical philosophy. And part of it might have been his involvement with alchemy. Um, something happened when he was involved with the alchemical process there in the early 1690s. Uh, but it seemed to um, affect his personality. Uh, did you? Can you comment on that? I, I think beyond beyond being aware of the change of personality, I, I have I have puzzled over this myself, and I have come to the conclusion it had something to do with his alchemical experiments. But I have yet to figure out what it was, and I have read a lot about this oh, aspect of Newton. Um, uh, Joseph, uh, I have to say. I'd like you to read my upcoming novel. Well, you send it to me, and I will. Okay, and it is about alchemy. Every Most of the characters in it are alchemists. And so that whole issue of what happened to Newton is addressed in my novel. Um, well, I will, I will read it with interest. Okay. My, my approach to, to Spengler and what you're suggesting with, with whatever's going on in the 16th and 17th century... Um, in terms in terms of the arts, I view the big change as being the change from the Baroque to the classical and the Romantic. In other words, J.S. Bach, Johann Krebs, Georg Friedrich Handel are summing up a tradition. And something new bursts on the scene, beginning to a certain extent with Haydn, but really getting underway with Mozart and Beethoven. Something very different happens in music. Try and listen to modern classical music. It's painful, it's awful, and it's ugly. Yeah, it is. I, I would is. much rather listen to a rock group uh, than modern classical. Give me a one, far. Give me a one, one uh, line uh, take on the 12 tone system. Uh, garbage. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's originality yeah. for originality's sake, yeah. and and that's why it fails. Yeah. Um, now, with you see the same thing going on, in my opinion, in the early Enlightenment, and Newton and Leibniz epitomize this for me for a very specific reason. When you look at Newton and how he's trying to apply mathematics to the physical sciences. He is applying a mathematics that he's invented for the purpose, the calculus, and he, he's invented a very clumsy version of it. But in the process, he's mechanized it. Leibniz, on the other hand, realizes that his step in the invention of the calculus is a first step in the invention of a formally specific algebra, a, a language that he's calling analysis situ, that is able to do other types of calculation that do not involve quantity. That it is a formally specific calculus designed to handle quality. And that's a wholly different thing. Yes. Now, this guy is thinking miles ahead of Newton, and I think he's doing so because he realizes in his study of the ancients, unlike Newton, that he's not dealing with people that have a mechanistic view of the universe. And to a certain extent, Newton's alchemy, the way he approaches alchemy, to me, is a clue that he's a thinking of the universe as, as a big metaphor of mechanism. Yes. This is this is the huge problem with him. Yes. Leibniz, Leibniz is not this way at all. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wish Leibniz had written some music because it would have been fascinating music to listen to. Oh, yeah. Uh, but he certainly was a, a very different character. And that, that Leibnizian impulse in the early Enlightenment basically is put to death, I, I think. By you know, by the likes of Immanuel Kant and Arthur yeah. Schopenhauer and that whole, you know, that whole crowd. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, I, I, uh, there seemed to be a second part of your question. Yeah, I've been watching sure him too and to... watching all these facial expressions. Of yeah, Jeremy he's got had. something. <laughs> 
point out because you would mentioned all this Atlantean technology and this whole Atlantis connection, and I just thought it was super interesting. Just yesterday, I watched a video by on DARPA TV here on YouTube, and uh, the video is called Power Everywhere, and they're talking about the future of uh, beamed power systems and, and platforms uh, where they're, they're using um, light beams to, to send energy and send power to uh, remote systems uh, and aircraft um, and, and everything. So with this beamed power, and I, and I just couldn't help but think about, this is Atlantis, Atlantean technology all day. Um, the idea of, you know, you're beaming energy, you have uh, the, these mirrors that could burn ships down with like, mm -hmm. la like lasers and, 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 and this type of technology. And um, I just thought that it's interesting that, you know, as far as we come, DARPA thinks the future is, is, is um, you know, this beamed power platforms where, where their power, power is beamed everywhere. Sure. Um, it's all these systems. And this is their future plan for the next 10 years to, to yeah. create power you, grids. You want Atlantis, Jeremy? Does everybody want Atlantis? Sure. I've got Atlantis for you. Yeah. Sure. Now, I want you, I'm not going to tell you who said this until after I finish reading it. And I'm going to read three different quotations from three different people, all talking about the same thing. I want you to listen very carefully. Quote, we see that the old geometers have made use of a kind of analysis which they extended to the solution of all problems, albeit they have hidden it from posterity. I well realize that they must have known a kind of mathematics that was very different from today's common one. Mm -hmm. Not that I think they knew it perfectly, and indeed, some traces of this true mathematics seem to me still to appear in Pappus and Diopontagus, who, though not belonging to the most ancient ages, lived many centuries before our times. I would also think that later on, it was suppressed by its very authors because of a certain wicked slyness, unquote. Guess who... Rene Descartes. My goodness. Mm. Now listen. Quotation number two. Quote, To be sure, the ancient's method is more elegant by far than the Cartesian one. For Descartes achieves the result by an algebraic calculus, which when transfused into words, following the practice of the ancients in their writings, would prove to be so tedious and entangled as to provoke nausea, nor might it be understood. But they accomplished it by certain simple propositions, judging that nothing written in a different style was worthy to be read, and in consequence, concealing the analysis by which they found their construction, unquote. Guess who? Isaac Newton. And now here's the pièce de résistance. <laughs> this one, this one is um, the big one. Quote: The ancients seem to have recognized and possessed such an analysis proper to geometry, for in their works I think I can make out some vestiges of it, namely of an algebra in which numbers are not the issue. Certainly it is by this art that they unfolded those propositions. Otherwise, we would not have had them for such a long time, which only with difficulty would we find using our modern methods. I think I've attained and discovered the foundation and first liniments of this art with which once we have found the right symbols and established some principles, we can obtain everything else by an imitation of calculating and with no need to follow the lines with our imagination, a result which I am not sure the ancients have ever attained, unquote. Wilhelm Leibniz. So in other words... All three of the greatest mathematicians of the 17th century are agreed on something, and that is the ancients that they know about have a method of analysis 
that has been lost or suppressed or hidden. Guess who? <laughs> and Leibniz goes even further and says, I think I see at least some outlines of what it is. Hmm. This is the man that thought the I Ching could be put into binary representation, folks. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Yeah. There so, we go. Nano Girl, we haven't heard from you in a while. What uh, What do you think of this? Or what, what have you been thinking about that you want to ask Joseph Sachery? Well, I want to go back a little bit to where you said we have the alien influence. And I know that in different iterations, you've all answered this, but what I always come back to is what is my role? Why am I here? You know, mm -hmm. do I have the power to change this? Is that what I should be doing? Is is the goal to get more intelligent, more open-minded about all the things that are happening and how do I participate? One thing I am noticing during this last, I would say it's definitely the last year, and even from people who aren't necessarily into this kind of thing is how fast we're manifesting everything we think and everything we, we <laughs> want to want to create. It's happening now. Like mm -hmm. I, I've been a student of this for a very long time, but I'm telling you it's now like yesterday I thought something and someone responded that quick. I didn't say a word. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing. And so I'm thinking about what are my thoughts? How are my actions? And so how, how am I impacting can I start to respond to this alien influence? You know, is that my role? Is that why we all, you know, people like us, we've come here. So, you know, you bring all these kind of interesting ideas. So I would throw it out to all of you. What do you think your role is in response to all of this? Well, to, to tag on to what you're saying there, it, it could be not just, um, you know, alien is one way, but um, it could be, perhaps an across time influence on us. You know, there's things other than transtemporal warfare that could be going on with this technology we're talking about. There could also have been some type of zeitgeist influence mechanism um, uh, in which this, uh, the, the, the Great Pyramid or, or Giza Death Star type technology that, you know, we're talking about here could, uh, could be affecting what you're talking about, Nano Girl? Like maybe it was decided, okay, at this point in the timeline, we want more people to get this concept, and that could have been sent out there uh, across time, you know, as an influence. Uh, what do you What do you guys think about that, anyway? And can I throw one one more thing? Sure. In, in just tagging what you just said, and. Mm -hmm. In some other iteration, did we plan to be here to do this, even to the detail of today? So we came together, people like us are coming together because we agreed we would do that. We would run into each other. We would support each other. This is what okay. we are here to do as well. I agree with you 100%. I do this too. is a planned event and at a very high level of the unconscious mind we're all in on it. We're all involved in it. And this is just a model of the larger world. We're all involved in it. And yeah. we all have our role to play in it in sure. our time. Sure. sure. Ryder, you were going to add something to that? Yes, sir. I was. Um, and I think this goes back to what Sheesh was mentioning earlier about this technology or this information given to us. I don't believe that he means that some entity physically came down and give this information to us. Like a lot of people uh, theorize with the, the ancient Sumerian tablets right. and stuff like that, that these gods physically came here and gave us this technology. And I address to to that. Work with. Can it's I address more of a consciousness that? thing. It's well, a consciousness um, manipulation of our consciousness. It's kind of um, like the... Uh, uh, 2001 a space odyssey with the monolith appearing you know the, the, the influence but of the others the i think sesh yes. uh, wants to respond to you there i just briefly i want to say uh the information was transferred in no one particular way um so don't just think in terms of a mental influence um i believe artifacts have been sure. have changed hands I and i'm in my opinion, I'm one of the people 
who believes that the Roswell incident w involved non-humans. And I do not believe it was a crash. I believe it was a handing off of technology um, and that it also was an act of ritual magic. So a uh, very complicated event. And I will be writing about that in my upcoming book. But that's an example of actual tangible, tangible material being handed off. But there are other instances where ideas could be planted in a person's mind in the dream state or in an awake state, as with Tesla. Sure, sure, sure. You just opened uh, up Bruce, a whole I thought I heard... Go ahead, of worms. You just opened up a big, huge can of worms right there with uh, Dr. Joseph Farrell on the Roswell event. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes, I know. We have our uh, differences, but and I respect his views, and uh, there are many views out there, but, uh, you know, I have my particular views as well, and that's one of them, and uh, I'll be writing about that in my upcoming book. Cool, cool. Bruce, I, I thought I heard you start to jump in with a comment a moment ago. Well, I, 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 I did. I piped in with um, an I agree with what Ryder was ah. saying. And, and you know, this is really about time and temporal warfare. Uh, um, um, I, I, I did a book with a fellow who uh, is quite adept at reading the Akashic Records, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Bar and we detailed it quite a bit that there has been a air now and you know I mean uh, uh, Buff, buffer careful with right point. they're very yeah, very buffer. It, yeah I think we got the buffering issue again but not, nonetheless he could mm -hmm. read And that it ended around 12 and 2014, we were set on a corrective course. Mm. Um, so uh, another thing I want to bring up is a fantastic movie that just came out. It's up for a Best Picture Award, Everything All at Once, um, right. which is this idea that, you know, going back to the first hour of the show before the panel was brought on, that time mm -hmm. is not linear. Well, if it's not linear, everything's right. happening all at once. So you're, right, you're technically, we are technically living all of our past lives at the same time, right now. Right? With yeah, like, like, like time, life. it's just time could be uh, spherical in that it's this burst of this whatever time is, if you want to call it an energy in, thing. In, and... in, the, in the eye of God, everything is now, and it's all That's there. That's what they say. That's what's written. It's yeah. all there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and how whatever we're doing influences the, the future as well as the past, right? And um, I, I I find that's one of the most interesting aspects of being alive, and has been to discover this or to understand it a little bit better. I'm still learning, and how I'm, you know, what is again, what is my role? How am I influencing it? what should i be doing every day mm -hmm. because i think that's why we came here was to learn but also to be a part of this huge change that's going on and hopefully influencing it in a direction that's going to be more human versus mm -hmm. this ai machine which i don't want to continue to live that you know i'd rather mm -hmm. see because i think humans are amazing our bodies are yes. amazing the energy I, I how agree. we in you know interact with each other and especially since we you know had to do the you know jib jab thing and be isolated for a couple of years coming back together you really i really appreciate human contact and connection more than ever more than ever mm -hmm. i don't ever want to go to a locked up situation again it was not amen no oh, i i hear you i hear you we're approaching the three hour mark i just um and, and you know um i just want to say bef uh, before we continue further i want to thank all of you for doing this because it was short notice for several of you and uh, yes this is my first time hosting a group a panel show and and i appreciate you all being patient for particularly when it shows that it's my first time doing this so again i appreciate uh, uh, the patience of all of you and in, in your participation and um I don't know how many of you want to go for another half hour. 
Um, I, I would like each one of you to get, you know, one more, feel like you get one more question in to uh, Seshari and Joseph before, you know, you do go. But um, how does that sound? Go another half hour? Or? We can do that, but I need a nature break. Okay. That, so that's I'll be fair right enough. Back. <laughs> that's fair enough. So um, I need a nature break, but I, I don't, strangely. <laughs> <laughs> so uh old guys let, need nature breaks yeah so um i don't know how we're going to get by without joseph here though <laughs> <laughs> well you know we we got you here to answer some questions okay, and, and I, some interaction here so i'll do um, the best i can I'm a... <laughs> let, let's go to be because of the 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 the, the tech issues being weird for uh, yeah. this time of day for for bruce's location uh, Bruce, you got any questions for uh, Sesh while Joseph's away? Um, yeah, how, how did you go down this rabbit hole? A very interesting life path and curiosity manifestation in your life. How did you, and you started way before any of this was popular. You've cited the, you know, people telling you things as far back as 1980. There's a curious story right there on a personal note, if you'd care to well, share. Let me tell you, Bruce, uh, if you can ever get a chance to read my book, The Handprint of Atlas, that would answer a lot of your questions. Um, I'll see to it I, that he gets a copy. Great. Okay. So I'd like Bruce, Bruce, I'd like you to read my book. Okay. And it's a little bit autobiographical, not much, but I felt like I had to uh, include some personal things in the book to, for for the reader to understand where I was coming from. And I felt it was legitimate as explaining the provenance of my ideas. And But briefly, um, my whole life has been uh, rather unusual. And um, there was no one time where uh, I suddenly got onto some track of trying to seek the truth. Uh, uh, I was always engaged in seeing things through my own eyes and because of that i think i was noticing some things other people around me weren't they were just taking the official line and so that was the you know how i continue to come up with some of these things did bruce take a nature break there he he, he might have had a <laughs> nature or tech break there but uh but uh my, nano my girl you got any you got any questions uh um, okay, and hopefully this is uh, in a lot. Again, I spent a lot of time listening to Joseph P. Farrell, and so uh, I hope you don't mind if I kind of take yeah. advantage of this moment in time to ask some questions. I've always been go right questions. ahead. That's that's why you're here. So yep. I know, and this is um, in connection to what we're doing here on the planet. And you've mentioned a number of times that we're in quarantine, right? That the planet feels like we're in some kind of quarantine. Mm -hmm. Do you think we'll ever, is there something humanity could do to get out of quarantine? And does that, in, does that, in, um, do we need to awaken more? Do we need to prove to, to something or did some of us come here to help the planet get more light? And so that's not necessarily the goal, but I know you've brought it up a number of times when I've listened to you. Well, the idea of, of a quarantine is, is a hypothesis that I advanced at, at the 2015 Secret Space Program Conference based on a particular reading in the Slavonic text of the Book of Enoch and other texts like it, that the orbit of the moon around the Earth form, forms a kind of quarantine or non-militarized zone. And that beyond that, we're not allowed to, to go. And other traditions have it not at the border or orbit of the moon, but at the orbit of the seventh planet, which would be Saturn. Um, my reading of that idea is solely as a, a cosmic war thing. It's, it's kind of a, as I pointed out at the time, it's a kind of cosmic Versailles treaty that Germany is going to demilitarize the Rhineland and put no military units there. And the reason why is that that pushes the mobilization point of the German military back considerably from the borders of Germany with France and Belgium and so on and so forth. So it's a purely military idea. 
It has nothing to do at, at one level with us being beings of light and all we have to do is change our vibrational frequency and all this other nonsense. If there is a aspect of that to the quarantine idea, I think it, it boils down to just quit being so warlike and bringing all of your weapons of destruction out here. Uh, cause you know, we don't want it. Um, if, if that's the case, then, you know, we've got a ways to go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask you a question, Joseph, about this. Uh, you mentioned Saturn, uh, just briefly, uh, I'm sure you must be aware of the work of Norman Bergeron. I think oh, yeah. his name is Ring Ring of Saturn. Of Saturn. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What do you think about all that? Uh, is, is there any substance to his ideas? I, I do think that there is, although I will be honest. I have a copy of the book. Yeah. Uh, I, um, so I have actually read the book. Uh -huh. uh, my opinion is that he's on to something, but that the argument that he advances to support his idea isn't anywhere near strong enough to to prop up the argument. But then again, he's making the argument with with dated technology and dated pictures. Yeah. Had he had the Cassini photographs of the rings of Saturn and some of the very strange things that are evident in those photographs, his case would have been much stronger. Um, are you inclined to make such a case yourself with present photographs or what uh, I'm say? inclined. I'm inclined to touch upon it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> but Fair not enough. to, but not to advance the case. I'll leave okay. that kind of case to Richard Hoagland and people oh, that are okay. that are more accustomed to making that kind of a case. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jeremy, you got any uh, any particularly uh, interesting technical questions that uh, you've been wanting to ask Joseph Farrell or Sash? Well, I came into this whole conversation on this idea that you know we might be. Uh, of facing an enemy with trans temporal capabilities, right. time tra travel capabilities. That's the overarching question here today. And then we got into an idea that, you know, maybe they're using AI to do predictive, you know, programming and, and predictive, uh, also, also predictive analysis that they, because it almost seems computational um, the way that, you know, policy decisions are being made these days. You mean so, like using AI to scout us, perhaps? Or just, you know, like, Think of all the different, you know, if this happens, then what what could happen? And and, and just you know, scouting out the scenarios, you know, like yeah, kind of like you you read the the old CIA documents of, of how they approached things in you know the uh, the guerrilla warfare manual, for example, uh, for uh -huh. South America, how how they're just like if they do this, you do this, you tell them this, you tell them this, and and it's just very systematic about how, and, and machine like about how they program yeah. um, right. agents. And, and recruited agents and and I, th I see a lot of that I, I just I, I just have a, I've always had a problem with the, the idea of time travel and then how do you beat an enemy that has time travel take capabilities so we're, we're all trying to fight this you this. you have time travel too and you that's how you beat them <laughs> yeah we you figure it out how to you figure the out how to way, do it yourself right it, yes it, it, I mean it's a basic principle of war it's called escalation <laughs> And then um, the idea. How do you beat a uh, hydrogen bomb? You build yourself a hydrogen bomb. Or two. Yeah. Or two. <laughs> how do you Go ahead, Jeremy. How do you beat statistics? I guess with more statistics, fight no, fire with no, fire. No, 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 no. You, you beat statistics by being an anomaly. Oh, okay. Uh, Very good. Go ahead, Jeremy. We <laughs> kind of Very talked good. over you there. Okay. Well, then, then the idea is, uh, well, you, you can you could beat the hydrogen bomb with with the same weapon, or you could do you know something better, you know, like oh well, a, a shotgun beats a pistol, and a you know yeah. an AK forty seven beats a shotgun, except in home defense. Speaking uh, of hydrogen bombs, uh, for all of those of you in the audience with a little spiritrium or plutonium, please contact me. Uh, I'll tell I'll tell you where to send it. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but don't send it in the open mails. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Lordy. You mean well, you put uh, over the counter where they, they ask yeah, what's in this yeah. package? Oh, over yeah. the counter hydrogen bombs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what? Uh, John Wheeler once left H bomb secrets on a train. And I can they, believe it. <laughs> uh, accidentally, the FBI took the in, entire train car apart um, <laughs> to try to find the documents. Um, funny story. Oh, but. Uh, my. Yeah, yeah. Or you could also beat a hydrogen bomb with a, you know, gamma ray laser uh, that oh, yes. right Earth, you know. <laughs> yes, um, you can. And and since they figured out the most power effect, you can you can actually uh, have have gamma ray lasers that you don't need a, an atom bomb or hydrogen bomb to set wow. off. That's why when they were talking about, oh, Russia and this Ukraine thing and the new, or the threat of nuclear war, I, I said, we have stuff that makes nukes look like child's play now. Right. Now, the bad right. news is so do they. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, Jeremy, I'm, I have a question for you. Um, what, in your mind, for you, would it take to um, uh, convince you that uh, time travel, say, or, 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 or trans-temporal technology is possible? What is the thing you're looking for? To... I was trying to devise an experiment, you know, and I just, I, I don't know an exact experiment you, you could do to, 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 to tell if, you know, if it's. Uh, wait a minute. Whoa. Stop. How, how would, how would you experiment? Whoa. Stop. Whoa. Okay. Whoa. 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 This. They've already done it. Go Ooh, online, okay. go to fizz.org and just punch in quantum entanglement experiments and time time crystal experiments and quantum time bubble experiment they've already done this this yes, is this is old news it this is the whole idea it gets into this this is it a quantum timekeeping thing or is it actually entanglement or is there some kind of quantum clock that keeps the time that that allows these things to stay you know once always spin up well these guys on these well, guys in the scientific community are never going to be able to answer that because they still think that they've got to plug all of this into einstein hmm. well the, it's that's Bell your Ray. problem yeah well they they, they the whole um we're out. Yeah, general relativity. Uh, I don't know. I we we. I know you have issues with Einstein and stuff, Joseph. Uh, you know, I, I just it, the, the whole thing is that there's a lot of different interpretations of the what's really going on in the physics, uh, whether it's entanglement, I know, or quantum timekeeping. Um, there's a lot a lot of interesting and you know interpretations both sides, but I, I just want to see like. I don't know. I have this problem with like the construct of reality is based on all the events that preceded it, lead up to that point, and and then the future is created from what we build out of the you know the, the current system of uh, events that we have our at our disposal right oh. now. So I just don't understand how you can go back to uh, it, and change that. It, it just it just violates the whole fabric of reality. Sure does. You know, you know uh, this reminds me. Now I think Jeremy's quite emotionally resistant to the idea of time travel i have a very good friend oh, yeah absolutely i would i would just off myself if, if it, yeah time i mean, I mean that's a legitimate that, end it. there's, there's no <laughs> use living i would just see myself because you could just go back and change anything and everything it'd be nutty right it but it exist anymore and i wouldn't want to live in it I got no you, but, no that, that you would not a, be uh, able to do that that's uh, you're making an assumption there about what time travel does and right I, I what i'm trying to get at with the whole idea of a set theory basis for understanding all of this is that that also prohibits you from doing that Ooh. i don't know because i know a girl who yeah it does it prohibits travel, you from doing that I knew a secret space program insider that was a my friend dated her. She was from uh, daughter of a NASA scientist, and and she, Amy Eskridge. She killed herself, and and she used to always talk about this time travel stuff. And I just thought she was nuts. Um, well, I'm very sorry to hear. You that. know the um, there is a resistance to the very concept of time travel. What I was going to say is I have a very good friend, and I was telling him about one of my novels, Metamorphosis, which is all about tr time travel. Mm -hmm. And um, he said he wasn't interested in time travel novels because they're boring, because time travel is impossible. Uh, and I said, you know, that's exactly what I used to think. Um, but I've noticed um, now they're on the Internet, they're talking about the Mandela effect. And one of the aspects of that is 
a lot of people are getting polarized about it uh, and they get very upset. You start talking about the Mandela effect and they don't want to hear it. They, uh, it's disturbing to them. And I can understand why it could be, but the point is that there is a psychological resistance to even thinking about time travel. And until you get past that, you can't deal with the possibility of time travel in a rational way or look at the evidence that it might be possible. You've got to kind of uh, detach yourself emotionally um, from the phenomenon as it might affect you personally in order to look at it. Uh, until you do that, you're actually blocking information for yourself. You're limiting yourself. Mm. You, you know, you've got That's to. I, I, so, know, I, I agree with what you said about the cycles and, and this whole idea that well, entanglement. You know, there's this quantum timekeeping across time and space that seems to be you know transverse. You know, even the farthest uh, reaches of the cosmos. Um, and this is it's an interesting interpretation of physics is that, you know, there's all these intertwined. Um, it's the same event that's occurring at different times. And, and there's this cycle, these cycles that are, that all add up and occur. So there, there might be some deeper physics in here. But as far as, you know, how to cross that boundary in, in you know, I, I know that there's local time travel, but then global affecting a whole universe around you to, to, to have that travel backwards in time. That's a little bit complicated, but they're also. Well, this, but this remember story. what I said. I said very specifically at the beginning of this talk that that's not what I'm talking about. Mm. I have said very specifically that the vector time. of the vector of time cosmologically keeps going in the same direction, but within it you can have localized mm. loops. Okay, and the yeah. other thing you have to get you have to understand is you cannot model this thinking in terms of standard physics geometry of arrows and so on and so forth. That, that won't help you. If you start to think of it in terms of elements that comprise an event yes. and model it as a set and as a subset of those elements, you have elements that are, we'll just call it the causational set of that greater set you can modify the elements that are not part of the causation set. And you might even be able to modify one or two elements within the causation set. But to, mod to modify all of them would produce the paradox. So what I'm trying to do is give you a mathematical analogy and a way of, of mathematizing the problem that does not lock you into the grandfather paradox of time travel that comes out of, of standard, you know, talk about time travel and physics. And you'll notice that when you change the mathematical language, you change the physics. This is, this is going back to what my big problem with Maxwell has been. There's not a physicist alive right now in graduate school that is using Maxwell's original equations. Amazing. They're using edited versions of linear algebra that was done by and partial differential equations that was done by Oliver Heaviside. Maxwell wrote those equations in quaternion geometry. That's a different ball of fish altogether because the quaternion geometry allows you to have a scalar potential. And you cannot throw it out as simply a zero vector. You can't do that. So in other words, the language you adopt will color, the language you adopt will color how you approach the problem. Mm -hmm. Yes, like the they just use the continuity equation to kind of gloss over all. all yes, all, yeah, and, they yeah. they look. Modern physics is full of all sorts of accounting tricks. My favorite being renormalization. Yeah. Whenever whenever physicists run into and infinity, they throw it out and they call it renormalization. They never stop to think maybe those infinities are trying to tell them something. Maybe this is something along the lines of Leibniz's non-calculable, non-numerical type of calculus. Maybe that's what they're trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. So they, they do this all the time. The biggest accounting trick of them all being the Lorentz transforms that led to special relativity. I mean... <laughs> 
Well, this is again, it's a spatial it's a spatial interpretation of trying to break down space. Yes. When in reality, space is, is non-local. This qu this quantum non-locality through this entanglement. Yes. Up, that's 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 linking everything together in time and space, um, so to speak. So yeah, space is is a holographic illusion in some ways, and and it's really all just uh, events echoing through time in different uh, different orders. So yeah, there's. There's some interesting physics going on when you get into quantum non-locality in the in these, these absolutely there is right. three right. interpretations. Right. But then, you know, space is an illusion. Well, you know, I might be able to teleport through uh, and, and and you know do something with space if if it's really this um, manifest construct of of uh, some mm -hmm. deep physics. Mm -hmm. um, again, yeah, we're we're so limited in what we know of physics. I mean, just think it's it's been. 10,000 years since uh, I think the invention of fire to our technology now. So we're, we're still, we're still babies. Still, here's still working noodle, on it. Here's a noodle baker for you. Do you remember what Linda Moulton Howe said in one of her talks about remote viewing and non-human entities or ETs? Why are the ETs interested in she, us? She said she said that they're interested in us because human beings have the ability to remote view over enormous cosmological distance and to do so accurately. We do not have the ability, to the extent that so-called ET does, of being able to communicate telepathically, even in close physical proximity. It's very difficult for us. Mm -hmm. Whereas she maintains that it's fairly easy to do for so-called ET. Now, whether you believe what she says there or not, it's an interesting proposition vis-a-vis -vis the idea of entanglement. Because in both cases, you're dealing with entanglement, but you're dealing with entanglement that is working under different system constraints. So in other words, even the idea of entanglement, what I'm trying to get across here, is so new in physics. Forget about John Bell and all of that. It's so new that we don't know all the parameters of it. And we're not going to know all the parameters of it until we start doing real science with what uh, Bruce is talking about, with intuition and those aspects of how consciousness works. None of us ever going to go anywhere. Interesting discussion on the microtubule structures that exist inside the brain and how they're um, just a, a perfect nest bed for entangled particles within the brain that have yeah. this. this mm. And if this, if uh, if if, if that if that's the case, you know, here's mm -hmm. here's the bad news. If Penrose is right and that's the case, then consciousness itself, the brain itself is really not the root of consciousness and it's not a local it's a transducer of it which is you know we're back to this to this paradigm that we've been wrestling with how do we explain things in a purely mechanistic materialist newtonian universe well right. answer we can't <laughs> yeah that's that's yeah. my bottom line we right. can't well let me uh let me bring Ryder in and then i'm going to go to bruce um Ryder, uh do you have any thoughts on this or any questions for Joseph Well, since, since we're on this whole time travel uh, topic and that's what the whole thing is centered around, what do you guys think of the Manhattan Project? Do you think that that was something real or was that just a fabricated conspiracy? Do you mean the thing? Philadelphia Project? Yes, the Philadelphia sorry, experiment? Phil Philadelphia experiment. Sorry, it's, I've had a really long day. <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Manhattan Project. Uh, Joseph was, uh, wrote a whole book on the Philadelphia experiment, so yeah. uh, you know you should ask him that question. Who was Carl Allen? <laughs> Who said that? That was Who's Jeremy. Oh. You know oh. that that's another one of those books I wish I had to do all over again because there's been a lot of books published since then, very interesting ones about the Philadelphia experiment. But basically, my approach to it has been through the work of Arnold um, Sonnenfeld, who was one of Einstein's colleagues that, that 
did a lot with indices of refraction and so on and so forth. And I have little to no doubt that the standard explanation of, of the Philadelphia experiment of degaussing coils along the three axes of the ship were probably the basis of the experiment, that they probably used frequency modulation in, in the experiment. And I have little to no doubt that the ship was rendered optically invisible, whether or not it was, it was transported, as some versions of the story maintain, from the Philadelphia Navy Yard several hundred miles down to the Norfolk Yard and appears out of green mist in front of a British carrier captain, and then green mist happens again, and back it goes to Philadelphia. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any difficulty imagining it, but by the same token, that version of the story has created such a mythology that has been added to the original story, which was simply they made a ship invisible and that Carlos Allende was on another ship and he saw the outline of the hole in the water. You know, that's, that's a different story. Um, so I have no difficulty with it. Um, concerning indices of refraction, what really, what really gets me is when I published the first pyramid book, Giza Death Star, at the end of the book, I speculated on a type of crystal that I was calling a phi crystal with an index of refraction of the crystal that would literally trap the light inside the crystal and thus make the crystal a kind of singularity. Okay, And I thought that was so out there that I, I really debated whether or not I was even going to put that in the book. You know, how do you, how do you create these electrical acoustic oscillators and that's what i came up with well in doing the fourth book i i'm you know going through the literature trying to you know see where they're at well lo and behold this is the kind of crystals they're talking about now literally crystals that have an, a weird enough index of refraction including negative indices of <laughs> refraction of all things so that the light literally gets bent in ways that a normal crystal would not do. So we're a short step already away from creating meta crystals that can function like singularities. And on and on we go. Or black bodies. Yeah. Black sure. bodies. Yeah, black bodies. And and they're doing weird things with acoustic crystals. I, I mean just downright weird. <laughs> just weird. So, so you know, we might we might we might be before the end of the century, be dealing with crystals that can literally create a mini singularity. Well, once you've said that, what have you said? You've said space warp. And once you've said that, hey, Einstein, we're in the time dimension again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I've. <laughs> Ryder, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. And it's very interesting because. Um... Bob Lazar, uh, whatever people think about Bob Lazar, whatever, it doesn't really matter. But he claims that this element 115 thing also reflects, refracts light as well. So I, think I can really believe that. What I don't sure. believe about what Lazar has been saying about element 115 is the idea that he and, and John Lear managed to scrape together right. enough of it to keep for half an hour at, Lear, at Lazar's home because right. the stuff doesn't last that long. <laughs> so don't just, last that long. <laughs> so let's. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring it over to Bruce. Bruce, uh, you're the. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, last Walter question. There was okay. <laughs> what? Go ahead, we Sesh. You want to throw in there on that? Yeah, I don't know if we have time. Do I have time to? Address? Well, we just got a couple. Of, we we just got okay. time for uh, Bruce to ask a okay. question. Let but, Bruce uh, have his question. Go well, ahead, Bruce. Actually, I, I, I will yield to Sesh. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm, uh, um, we could go down a whole bunch of rabbit holes. Jeremy yeah. brought up the super soldiers. I had a seventh, I've had a seventh gen up here at this uh, remote uh, place in Costa Rica twice. Mm -hmm. And I've heard all the stories as well. And um, it seems from what they're saying um, that, you know, the human race is very much involved in this temporal warfare. And um, 
it's a whole other topic it's it's a very ugly comes out of some very dark circles and mm -hmm. and maybe it's better for another conversation but i will i will yield the session let him uh, let him go yeah i'd like to hear that bruce we need to do another show on this and no oh, this is just this out. is just the first this, of what i hope is, is many beginning. on this topic Absolutely. Uh, i wanted to address the philadelphia experiment real quick if i could uh, your question there. So um, I uh, touch upon the Philadelphia experiment in my book, The Handprint of Atlas. Um, and the little bit I know about it, uh, I correlated that with what I was learning with ley lines. That's uh -huh. a whole uh, complicated subject to get into. Mm -hmm. But essentially, um, what struck me in the Alinde letters, he spoke of uh, this event that it, uh, they call it the Philadelphia experiment. Actually, what Allende claims he saw wasn't even in Philadelphia. It was right. out in the middle of the ocean. Right. Okay. True. So there are actually two different events at least. And right. the other thing is the Philadelphia experiment proper did not occur during World War II. It occurred afterwards. Okay. And Allende had only heard about it as a rumor. OK, yes. that, that's one point I wanted to make. That's true. Um, and but it was that rumored event that so interested me, because in Alinde's letter, he said that it occurred uh, with Philadelphia, that the ship was birthed in Philadelphia and it was transported instantly to Newport News, Virginia. Virginia. Well, I already knew that a ley line, I'll call it a ley line. All right. But. It's truly a stress line in the earth. It's created by continental drift. And you can clearly see it on the east coast of the United States. Uh, it forms Delaware Bay. Uh, I think it's Delaware Bay uh, is the uh, mm -hmm. body of water there, Philadelphia, between Philadelphia and Newport News. Uh, and it's a curved line. I already knew about this. And I found it far too coincidental that... Um, the two nodes on that stress line were Philadelphia and Newport News. Uh, it, this was very much like what Tesla was doing in Colorado Springs, where he was sending energy along a stress line of the Earth that runs, basically it divides the North American continent into two parts. And one of the parts of the stress line runs up to, to Mount Cleveland, and the other one runs down to the mouth of the Rio Grande River. Uh, it, it forms the course of the Rio Grande River. So Tesla was already doing this in Colorado. He was also doing it with Wardenclyffe. The stress lines there show why he cited Wardenclyffe where he did. And so I could see that a similar pattern was going on there in, with a Philadelphia experiment. Um, these stress lines are waveguides. Uh, mm -hmm. They are definitely waveguides for Hertzian radio waves. Uh, they apparently are waveguides for longitudinal electricity. Bingo. Uh, and, and many other things. And um, Walter Bosley and I spent years uh, with his Empire of the Wheel studying yes. the esoteric use of these same structures so all I can tell you is it looks like there's a pattern there that uh, supports what Alinde was saying in his letter. Yeah. yeah. Well, folks, I think we've exhausted the discussion for today, but really only in introducing this topic. I definitely, definitely intend to do more episodes on this 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 general rabbit hole we're going into, this question of uh, transtemporal cosmic war. Um, I want to thank each of the panelists, alien scientists, nano girl, Ryder Lee, and Bruce McDonald, for all of you for doing this short notice. I greatly appreciate it, and I uh, appreciate Seshari and Joseph Farrell, of course, for, uh, for, for being here and um, offering their knowledge and, and uh, ideas. And I want to thank all of you for having patience with me as the first time ho first time hosting a, a group talk like this. So I'm learning, you know, the ins and outs as I go with this. So um, again, 
thank you all. I know my audience appreciates it. And, um, uh, you know, again, I can't thank you enough for being here. And, uh, folks, that's uh, where we're going to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this. I know I did. This was phenomenal for me and, and uh, certainly my viewers. And um, we'll, we'll have this discussion again. So good night to all of the panelists and to Seshari and Dr. Joseph Farrell and all of you watching. And um, I will be back on the live stream Monday. This Sunday, there's this, there's this sporting event going on on Sunday that might uh, kind of dilute the audience. So we're, we're just going to do my live stream on Monday. Um, and that'll be with my guest, Martin Popoff. So um, folks, have a good night. Have a great weekend. And I will be back on Monday. Awesome show, Walter. Thank you. Thank Joe. you. Thanks, Send me the link, Walter, when you get it posted. I will. I will definitely do that.